League, um, the Climate Justice League uh, paid for Kai to come out here, um, which is great. Um, and uh, we're really lucky to have him here to like give us a lot of background um, and advice about how we can uh, both of assert our community's rights to self-governance and um, in doing so stop um, the dirty coal trains come, come, from coming through your genes um, if that moves forward. Um, uh, Noko Eugene uh, would love your help. Um, after this, we'll have I'll have signups for the different teams that we have that you can help out on. Uh, one is working on crafting the language of the ordinance, which will involve talking to, to various groups and people to get input, um, and then submitting it and, and all that stuff. Um, we have a group that's working on outreach to get more people involved, and media to get media attention. Um, and then we have a group for Building more coalitions uh, with other people, reaching out to neighborhood associations, um, and all the all the groups that would be affected, um, and one for planning actions uh, to draw more attention to um, our efforts. So afterwards, I'll have sign-up sheets over here. Um, thank you all for coming and signing in, hopefully, and I will take the way. Yes, my name is, is Kai Hushka. I work for a group called the Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund. Uh, we started and are still based out of Pennsylvania, though we have uh, a few of us in different parts of the country now, including here in the Northwest. Um, and as Zach talked about, um, you know, we'll talk a little bit about coal, but um, really where I'll spend most of my time with is just kind of talking about the underlying structure about who decides, in essence, who decides what your community is going to look like. Is it you and your community or is it somebody else that's deciding? Um, so we're going to look at some of the structural stuff about how that works and what communities have come up against. Uh, whether it's been issues around coal or uh, other energy extraction processes or factory farms or corporate water withdrawal, you know, it's, it really ends up boiling down to this question of who decides, um, you know, whether that practice goes forward or not. So we'll spend most of our time, so I'm going to kind of lay some things out, um, all coming from our own learning as, as an organization uh, over the last, um, I guess, 17 years now. And so as we've been learning, uh, we've been adding more of that information to things so as we work with community groups. Uh, the whole idea is to get other people to understand um, how the broader structure works. Um, because if we feel like it needs to be changed, we have to know what it is that we have to change in the first place. Uh, can we just in with questions? What's that? Can we just break in with questions? Uh, do you have a question already? Yeah. Are you well, a lawyer? Uh, no, I'm not. Oh, okay. I want to know, I want to know that. Uh, so, um, I think what may have pulled a number of you in here tonight is this, this issue about proposals to build uh, shipping terminals here in Oregon. Um, there's also proposals to build such shipping terminals in Washington State, uh, all to uh, give an exit point for coal that's being proposed to be uh, pulled out of the Powder River Basin, uh, Montana and Wyoming, to then ship over to the, to the Far East, China and other countries over there to burn their coal plants for energy. And so there's a number of these proposals being looked at for these shipping terminals, one of them uh, being Coos Bay, others within the Columbia, uh, Longview, Washington's another location, uh, Cherry Point north of Bellingham is another location for one of these shipping terminals. And these are all in the process right now of going through uh, permitting and other evaluation processes, so none of them are actually at the point of being built. Um, but they have uh, definitely uh, awakened a number of folks to um, the issue itself. Um, including the city of Bellingham that um, has uh, actually taken from the stuff uh, that I'm going to share tonight uh, as well as some deeper courses and actually have, have stepped forward to put an ordinance together to try to stop um, the coal trains from coming through their community. Um, that's the basic uh, what's happening um, around the actual coal trains themselves. Um, but really what it comes down to again, as I was talking earlier, is we've got a, a structural issue around that who decides about those coal trains. Uh, and overwhelmingly what we see when it comes to these issues of high importance, uh, it's usually not us in our community actually deciding, but it's someone else. In large cases it's a corporate interest that's deciding for us, even if we have opposition to something. Uh, and that comes really from how structurally things are set up. And so it's, un it's good for us to understand how that structure operates. Um, so that's probably pretty much what I will, will dive into for, for most of the workshop. And again, feel free to ask questions as, as we go, make it as interactive as possible. Um, a little background on us again. We started in 1995. Uh, we're a nonprofit organization. Uh, we're what we call a public interest law firm. We offer free legal services. Uh, so um, 
once we started doing that, as you can imagine, as community groups, um, you get a lot of phone calls because you're free. <laughs> so, and there were a lot of issues happening uh, at the time we started in rural Pennsylvania. Um, shortly after we started, there was a big influx of factory farms, so large feeding operations coming into Pennsylvania, migrating out of some other states south of there, uh, and wanting to set up shop in Pennsylvania. And we had a number of communities starting to call us to say, well, we don't really want factory farms in our community. We're farming communities as it is, but we don't think that that's sustainable type of farming. We want to protect the kind of farming we have, and these corporate factory farms are not something that we want to see. Um, so we started helping these communities, uh, either doing their own legal research, or eventually when uh, the people who founded the organization actually had law degrees and passed the bar and actually could practice law, they started actually defending them from a, from a legal perspective. Uh, we work with about 500 different communities now across the country. Uh, we've been uh, special legal counsel in about 200 municipalities, just to give some kind of scope of the number of different uh, areas that we've worked in. Um, through our work, both as legal advisors and have in some cases sort of community organizers, uh, we've compiled things into uh, a day and a half long or two day long workshop that we call democracy schools. Uh, I think there's a proposal to host a couple of these in Eugene in September. Um, and this is the curriculum that we go through, so three hundred page curriculum that we go through in a day and a half. So uh, a lot of information, and tonight I'm just going to touch upon a little bit of it. Uh, but the basic idea is to try to get others to understand, unravel, and be exposed to how, in essence, our legal structure and our governmental structure has been set up, and why we're, we're always in this position of trying to fight against things, and then in the end really realizing we don't really have the decision-making power as it stands. Um, so we started working, uh, as I said, mainly with communities dealing with factory farms, and also at the same time uh, a large influx of uh, land-applied sewage sludge. Uh, which has nice names like biosolids. Um, this is basically taking your municipal uh, waste uh, from your sewer treatment plant and actually land applying it. Uh, about 60% or more of it's land applied. A lot of it's actually land applied to farm fields because it's classified as a nutrient. Um, and so this was happening a lot in these rural communities in Pennsylvania. And the, every sort of toxic thing you can think of that like gets sent down the drain gets, ends up at these sewer treatment plants. So you're dealing with something that, in a lot of people's view, is, is not very safe to have, especially if you're growing your food in it. Um, so we started working with these communities um, around these issues. And when you start to work in these issues like factory farms, uh, where you invariably end up is around some type of a state regulation around that particular practice. So around factory farms, there's usually regulations that say, how is this factory farm going to operate in your particular state? In Pennsylvania, that was the case. So there was a, the Department of Environmental Protection in Pennsylvania, it's the, it's the, you know, the state agency that, that monitors, in essence, or regulates the factory farm operations in the state of Pennsylvania. And when we started this work, um, or about the time we started this work, there were actually a number of these communities that had very uh, stringent sort of local regulations around uh, applying sewage sludge to, to land. Uh, enough so that uh, as these factory farms are looking to come into Pennsylvania, they realized it was a barrier to them, that these, these regulations would actually make it uh, expensive for them to operate their factory farms because of the conditions in which these, these communities had placed upon the practice of land applying sewage sludge. Um, so as the corporate interests do, um, they're not stupid, um, they went to the state legislature and actually passed new law to regulate factory farms. And in Pennsylvania, they passed something called the Nutrient Management Act. Uh, and this became the overarching law that would regulate factory farms. And really, its whole purpose was just to look at how are they going to manage the manure? So what's your plan? What are you going to do with it? And on all kinds of little uh, items around how much can be land applied per acre and all these other things. But it was really focused on the manure as that being the only thing of which needs to be focused on with the factory farm. And we'll get into an exercise later. Um, around really the true scope of something like factory farms really is about, in essence, what the community saw factory farms represented versus what the state regulations said factory farms needed to be paying attention to. Um, so with something like a Nutrient Management Act, it becomes then very uh, clear from a lot of different perspectives <coughs> about how you have to go about actually confronting the issue. So as a community group, uh, a group of citizens that hearing about this factory farm coming into your little town, um, the first place you end up is, is at the Department of Environmental Protections, in Pennsylvania's case, 
to look at the permitting process. Because with all these kinds of operations, whether it's factory farms or other kinds of things, they usually have to file a permit. So that's where the community groups would end up, is with the permit process, or in essence, eventually a, an appeal of the permit itself. And that's where we would step in as a law firm and say, okay, well, we can come and help you appeal the permit. Um, so invariably, the, the permit would be submitted. We would pick up the permit and, in essence, review this thing. Some of them are very large, you know, as large as this book or larger. And you'd go through it. You'd find deficiencies or omissions in the permit. That was the practice. And that still pretty much is the practice of the convention, conventional environmental laws that stands today. This is what we did. We would look for deficiencies in the permit. And invariably, you would find it. Um, and not because we were expert lawyers, it was just that rarely do these permits ever get looked at or appealed in the first place. So a lot of these slide through even if they have deficiencies because no one actually points them out. So we would go in, we'd find the deficiencies, you'd go in front of the judge, you tell the judge that there's all these different things wrong with this permit and therefore he can't um, actually uh, call the permit administratively complete. He can't accept the permit as, as complete. In essence, he would throw the permit out. Uh, as the community group who hired us would look at that, they would get all excited. Said, okay, we stopped. We stopped this factory farm from coming into our community because now the permit has been thrown out. Um, so there would usually be a party, um, to celebrate the end of factory farms, and also to put it in context, if uh, has anyone been to a factory farm or read about it or seen videos? Or Give some sense of what I'm talking about here. Yeah. In Pennsylvania was 10, 15, 20,000 head hog factory farms. Uh, and in some cases, the communities weren't only getting one of these or two of these, but they were getting upwards of five of these things in their community. And when I say community, I'm talking about townships in Pennsylvania, three or five or 6,000 people. <laughs> so in essence, the hogs were far outnumbering the people. Um, and as you can imagine, how much manure uh, you know, a couple tens of thousands of hogs produces. Um, so anyway, there'd be a party celebrating gay in factory farms, um, but invariably it could be a couple months, could be six months. At some point, the corporation would come back with their corrected permit and they would resubmit. Uh, we would get a call again from the community group saying, hello, hello, red flag, the factory farm corporation is back now, they want a site, you need to come in and do the work that you did last time and find something wrong with it. Uh, and invariably what we would tell them is, well, we, there is nothing else we could do. We would review the permit, any sort of deficiencies that we found the first time had all been corrected. So thereby, that we would exhaust all our legal options within the permitting process um, as, as it stood from a legal perspective. And so invariably, um, the things of which we had set out to help as an environmental law firm, uh, we were now done as far as what we were able to do. So in essence, whatever it was that was proposed was now coming in. Uh, there was nothing left to do within the appeal permit process. And we did this for seven years. I didn't do it, um, thankfully. But the others who did it, um, basically the way that one of our attorneys describes it is it's like Groundhog Day, that movie Groundhog Day, is, mm -hmm. you know, where you're basically reliving the same thing over and over and over again. Uh, because it was all the same process, all the same scenario of what the end result was going to be. And uh, in fact, when it came down to the end of actually stopping to do this kind of legal work, um, we actually had attorneys from the corporate interests coming up to us to thank us for finding the deficiencies and the emissions from the permit in the first place. So we were getting patents on the back from the corporation saying, thank you very much for making a better permit for us. Because um, it actually saved them some trouble in case someone else later on looked at it and found some deficiencies in which they wouldn't have to deal with <coughs> in the future. Uh, we actually saved them a lot of trouble and a lot of time and, and some money. Um, so we were sort of at a crisis point as an organization after doing this for seven years in that we weren't doing what we thought we were set out to do, which was to protect these communities, protect the environment. Uh, we thought it was just uh, a matter of having more lawyers exercising the laws as they stood and that our problem was that if we just had more lawyers, we would have, in essence, a better environment, better community. Um, but we ran up into this sort of Groundhog Day scenario and realized that we were actually weren't doing what we had set out to do. Um, and the reasons why, and we, we do this within our democracy school, and we'll do it here tonight, um, we'll kind of do a visual about why that comes to be, in essence, how the regulatory system works. And we're going to use factory farms as our example, but in some ways you can drop about any sort of major issue into this diagram here, and it's basically going to operate in the same way. Um, so to start, 
what we're going to do as a group is um, just sort of throw out ideas about if you live in a community and a factory farmer is coming in, you didn't want the factory farm, what might be some reasons about why you wouldn't want the factory farm coming into your community? Suffering all the animals. Animal cruelty? Okay. Yeah. Smell. You guys can just throw them out. So. Smell? Smell? Yeah. <coughs> Antibiotic resistant disease. Yeah. Yeah. Air and water pollution. Yeah. Water pollution and air. What else? The food that the animals eat a lot of times is GMO and that goes into the product. Okay. Hurting small farmers and ranchers. What's that? <coughs> Hurting small farmers and ranchers. Okay. Local farmers. Freight traffic. Traffic. Hurting local ecosystems. Anything else? Producing food that's not healthy. Water availability. In some places. <coughs> Anything else? Maybe one more. So we've got a pretty decent list. Um, these are basically the same kind of things that these small communities would actually state as being the true situation of allowing factory farm in. So in some ways, you can view it as they had a kind of more complex view of what factory farming actually meant. Um, and so when these things would get proposed, and again, you could take other issues which you feel might be a threat to your community, and you can probably make again a very similar list uh, whether it's maybe natural gas drilling, whether it's sewage sludge, whether it's uh, corporate, uh, you know, water withdrawal. I mean, there's, and you can, as a community, you typically come up with a lot of reasons for why you wouldn't want something like that. So with factory farms, these are the kind of things that uh, the communities themselves would think about uh, when they were hearing that the factory farms were coming. Um, some of you may know that uh, actually it's now exceeded, I guess, equipment-related death, but suicide is the number one cause of death of small farmers, even in this country. Wow. We hear a lot about it in India and other parts of the world, but that's the case here. <laughs> so there's, there's that aspect, of course, is the local economy, there's your own type of property values, and then, again, there's other things that you get at in the list about why the community wouldn't want it. So, so as those things are not okay. What's that? Yeah. Problems that are listed up there. <coughs> exactly. So they're not they're not part of what in in Pennsylvania's case because you it's beautiful because in Pennsylvania you have the Nutrient Management Act and of course anything and everything that you need to look at around factory farming is all of course contained in the Nutrient Management Act, which of course is really all focused on manure. It's not focused on any of these other things here. So you have the Nutrient Management Act, yet you have a problem statement that is stated by the community, or as us here in this room. And as I mentioned, you have typically you have an agency, so you have a state of some some agency of the state, Department of Environmental Protections, for instance, is who you would go to to understand, well, how do we actually try to keep factory farming out? Well, they would say, well, thanks for calling. Uh, we have something called the Nutrient Management Act, and you can go ahead and challenge the permit as it's being submitted under the Management Act for the siting of the factory farm. Um, another element uh, is the corporation. Um, you see this more clearly in something like natural gas drilling now, as the drillers are looking for other places to drill. Um, that the corporations end up being also kind of a, a contact point because, in some cases, they're the only ones talking about the activity itself. So we've got the community meetings that are always held by the corporation. The corporation in the factory farm world of Pennsylvania will tell you the same thing. Well, if you have concerns, you need to go to the Department of Environmental Protection, and you can look at the Nutrient Management Act, and you can actually, in essence, challenge the permit as the permit is submitted. Another entity of which um, doesn't have a specific name, but we call it um, the culture. So even when we organize our activism, a lot of activism is also driven towards this idea, well, we have to go to the regulatory system or the regulations around a particular practice, 
Um, you can't, in essence, do anything else. You can't bring all these other things up because it's not allowable. Only whatever's in the Nutrient Management Act is allowable. So even our own cultural mindset says, well, you have to follow the rules, in essence, of whatever has been laid out. Uh, and another thing I didn't mention, in a lot of cases, in most cases, those regulations that have been laid out are usually written by the industry that's going to be regulated. So, and again, you see it most egregiously right now in the, in the drilling world. It's, it's very clearly the oil and gas industry writing the legislation, handing it off to the state legislators who then vote it in and put it in place. And that's all about supposedly regulating their practice. And the reason why we have a triangle here is that all that stuff drives you down to what we call um, a single regulatory point or a single point. And in the case of factory farming, that single point is all about manure. So in essence, it takes what we just described as very, very, very complex, you know, very broad, uh, a lot of reasons, uh, a lot of concerns, a lot of issues of which we as the community consider this issue of factory farming to be about. And it drives us all down to have this discussion about shit, about manure, um, because that's how the regulations are set. So it drives you down to the single point. And not only does all, all these things drive you down to the single point, but um, when I say us, I mean people like the Legal Defense Fund, when we practiced this kind of law for seven years, we also drove communities down to the single point. Because as a law firm, that's all we were left with, because the law, you have to practice whatever the law says. And so we were left with also using the Nutrient Management Act to somehow protect these communities. But invariably, all we were doing was driving people also down to this single point. In essence, all these other issues could never be argued because in essence, as you were saying, they're not part of the law itself. The law is all about whatever is within the Nutrient Management Act. So our whole job was to find efficiencies within the permit as described within the Nutrient Management Act. And everything else is in essence non-existent. It doesn't exist under that, uh, that, that law itself. And the other reason we draw this in this manner is not only to show, in essence, the basic summation of how the regulatory system works, but also in some ways to show what happens to communities. So in essence, if this is the community, like cattle, you get driven down a chute, and guess what happens when you get to the end of the chute? Well, you get the bolt to the head. That's barely what happened with all these communities we were helping, is we actually helped them, we helped drive them down the chute, even as a law firm, because we were practicing the laws as it was laid out, by something like the Nutrient Management Act that was actually constructed by the, the large corporate agricultural businesses themselves to regulate themselves. So part of why we do this is to show you that it's, it's no surprise we have the conditions we have uh, because of the way that we allow things like regulatory law to be written and actually who's writing that law. So this is a lot of what, again, we did. This was our Groundhog Day scenario. And again, you can drop just about any issue into it and it's going to operate fairly similarly. Now, there might be different layers of permits. There could be a federal permit, there could be a state permit. <coughs> the basic premise is you are, in essence, running into this regulatory system, which the regulatory system is about allowing something to happen. It's about regulating it. I mean, if you break the proper word, it's never about saying no to it. And then within the regulations, you have permitting, which is about permitting something again to happen. Or in a lot of cases, when it comes to big issues, it's about permitting a, permitting a level of pollution. In essence, legalizing a certain amount of pollution, saying it's okay if we pollute this much, because now it's part of the regulatory scheme, it's legal. So it's all about using law in order to push the practices through, which we've done as in time of war and as human beings. We've always legalized whatever it is that we wanted to validate. And so that's why we legalized slavery, because we validated it under the law. It wasn't just about the violence and suppression of people for the sake of doing so, but we actually legalized it. And so we still have that same condition now, especially around environmental stuff, where it's the law, and we have regulatory law in essence to manage it, um, but we're allowing it, we're permitting a certain amount of pollution to happen. Which is also another reason to look at, when we look at major environmental indicators, you know, we're not doing very good. In fact, in most cases, we're doing worse than we were doing 40 years ago. And so when you look at, okay, we're in worse shape than we were 40 years ago, except we think we're under a rule of law that's been about protecting the environment, and that's not what it's been doing, maybe we need to look at the system itself around how it's been working, or unless it's not working from our perspective, and maybe start to think differently about what it is that we have to do differently. I'm going to stop there for a second. Any questions? Good timing. <coughs> Again, we, in our democracy school, we spend a lot more time getting to this point. So this might seem pretty rapid, pretty rushed. Um,
especially if you haven't been involved, let's say, in a permit appeal or have been involved in a certain group and start to fight something, it all may be kind of new and foreign and different to you. So I apologize for that. We don't have a whole lot of time tonight, so kind of get at least some of the general things out there. Um, like I said, the, the, the democracy schools take more time to get to that point, get some more background, and sort of ease into it a little bit more instead of just throwing it into the deep end. Mark. It's one of the highway projects I fought many years ago. Army Corps of Engineers official who was in charge of the permit to destroy the weapon that the highway was going to go through told me that privately he was against the project, but he wasn't allowed to be against the project. What he was trying to do was build the highway in the best way possible so that it had the least amount of weapon impact. He wasn't trying to, he wasn't, he wasn't allowed to stop the damage, he was trying to mitigate the damage. Mm -hmm. And what people also don't understand is it was the Nixon administration that came up with the body of regulatory law that we all suffer under now. And you know, it's not that hard to figure out what their motivation is. Yeah, and some, and some people even view regulatory law really for the, mainly for the corporate interests as being actually a good thing because it shields them from the liability of their practice. Because in essence, you've made it legal now to do whatever it is. So. Whatever damage comes out of it, well, it's fine because it's legal. And if you happen to exceed it, well, then and you violated, let's say, your permit, then it gets into a whole other world around negotiating some monetary impact of what it is. Which interesting, yeah, across the business. But interestingly enough, in most cases, excludes whatever it is that you damage, whatever ecosystem you damage. In most cases, and even in the equation, um, because of the ways that the laws are set up. There was one official actually in the Bush one administration, who his name was Gordon Dunnell. He was head of the International Joint Commission on the Great Lakes. And he was a conservative Republican. He was a friend of Dan Quayle. But he looked at the science of pesticide and herbicide exposure in the Great Lakes and came to the conclusion that the regulatory system had been a complete failure. It would take a thousand years to investigate every chemical. We needed pollution prevention instead of pollution regulation, which was ahead of where most of the environmental groups were. Yeah. And so if a conservative Republican can come to that view, um, anyone can come to that view. Uh, I was just going to say, in terms of coal, um, at a meeting we went to yesterday with the Commission Sustainability Commission, um, we had a person from the Port of PK come speak, and they were talking about um, how they've been doing lots of studies on the area and how they're really concerned about the environment and the health and the safety of the people near the port. Um, as it was really to me. I mean, yeah. this is exactly what this is, is sure. that working within what's allowable under the laws to validate the work that they're doing. Which is That's just, another good word. You said mitigate, you said allowable. So allowable harm will mitigate the harm. I read a quote the other day on uh, natural gas building and whole fracking stuff going on um, that uh, I think it was a medical doctor that said that all mitigation means is putting a longer fuse on the time bomb. And that was her view of what mitigation truly means um, around her view of, of the way that we allow these things. In essence, we make them allowable. We permit it. It goes through, in essence, um, because of the way that the system is set up, in essence, for us not to say, no to these things that are obviously, from a community's perspective at least, harmful from a lot of vantage points. Again, not just environmentally, but economically, and socially, and, and all the other things. Um, but how the system itself doesn't put us in a position even to say no, or if you want to flip it, it doesn't even put us in a position to say yes. And we'll get into some more of what that means. You know, even if you want to advocate for something, maybe you're not against something, but you actually ad want to advocate for something. There's structural things that we run into, including including this structure here around regulations. And the next thing we'll get into is sort of the other barriers that force us to stay within a certain frame of thinking, and that's with a certain frame of activism, because that's where they want to keep the folks, in essence, uh, away from the understanding that they have deeper structural issues. Uh, else? Question? Yeah, I, I find all this very interesting. I, I met with all the state agencies today. Um, we serve on the Governor's Regional Solutions Council. So there was somebody there from basically everybody from mining, you know, Bob's used to specific from mining, and we had somebody from El Rapa. And it was really interesting because the battle has to do with carbon view. 
which they're taking down, that's a Dexter, they're going to take that down, they're going to use 400 feet of that mountain to build a rail railway to Coos Bay through all the coal uh, out of the, the terminals in Coos Bay. So we've been engaged in discussions with uh, the Port of Coos Bay and with the governor's office and with my attorney and with the corporation that's doing the mining. But it, it was interesting because in the meeting today, every person heading the state agencies was supportive or sympathetic to the town of Dexter individually. But each one of them said, well, you know, we have very limited authority in our agency and we have to work within the law, even though, you know, we have very narrow parameters here in Arapa, they have very narrow parameters in Dogami, the state agency of mineral extraction. And so one of the things that came up was the amount of decibels created by dynamite blasting, which turns out to be well over the threshold of damaging human ears up to a mile away wow. from the source of blasting, which includes <coughs> 2,000 people in Dexter, Oregon. And the one was shocked and said, well, somebody has to regulate that. Who regulates that? El Rapid, is that you? Well, no, we're not authorized to, represent, to, to regulate sound. That would be somebody else. And it got pushed around. It turns out nobody had authority <coughs> to regulate noise pollution in rural residential zoning except through site review, which the citizens of Dexter have been denied through a loophole in the law, which the corporations knew of two, year, two years ago, which says that if they leave a 200-foot setback from the site of the mine to the nearest exploited. community, their, um, their site review is waived. So the community has absolutely no say in what goes on there whatsoever. But it's very frustrating and it's, it's very interesting because this is exactly what's happening. It all comes down to Dogami, who are funded by the mining industry. That's where they get their, their funds. And it's a regulatory thing. And when we pointed out all the mistakes on the application, Dogami said, well, okay, these are mistakes on the application. Yeah, I see where they made these mistakes. We'll work with the industry and we'll make them correct the mistakes before they renew the permit. Okay, so it's kind of good work. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Just, right. Have they started blowing stuff up already? They're drilling today. Wow. Like they just started? To plant the dynamite, yeah. They're ready to blow off the top of the mountain. So just to give some, some context, this, this stuff doesn't come out of thin air. I mean, it has, there's a rhyme and a reason for why we have uh, a regulatory type system. And in fact, the interesting thing is, um, especially particularly towards this issue of concern communities are having around the coal trains, it was actually the the railroads that actually prompted the first regulatory agency to be put in place in the first place, which a lot of regulatory agencies are modeled after. And this was in the late 1800s when there was the big expansion of the railways out west. Under the process of doing so, they were interfering with uh, ranchers and farmers and communities. Um, uh, fences were being destroyed, cattle was being killed. Uh, a lot of things were happening uh, as the railways were, were pushing in these uh, localities, mainly counties themselves. We're looking at trying to hold the railways liable to some level um, based on their activities. And they're trying to do so by tax, typically, in essence. Okay, you're going to put your railroad through here, you're going to cause some damage, in essence, there's going to be an impact to your activity, we're going to tax you for it. Um, and eventually what came out of it, a lot of different things came out of it, one of the things that came out of it was the Interstate Commerce Act of the late 1800s, which then formed the first regulatory agency was the Interstate Commerce Commission that became this commission of which was supposed to regulate the railroads. In essence, it was uh, um, there to supposedly protect the community, the individuals, from railroad activity to make sure things like pricing and other those kinds of things were being, in essence, monitored by this overarching agency. Um, but the interesting thing is, and this uh, quote I'm going to read uh, actually came from the Attorney General a few years after that, that law had passed. And this is a, a comment, um, I'm not exactly sure where it was pulled from, but it was a comment made to the president of the Burlington Northern Railroad um, in referencing what he viewed the Interstate Commerce Commission actually being about. Um, and in some ways it kind of it summarizes a lot of what regulatory agencies are still about today. And again, it has nothing to do with the individuals themselves that are part of the <coughs> organizations. There's, uh, I've talked to a number of these people, and, and they do get extremely frustrated because I think they also have potentially a different view before joining some of these groups about what their role is going to be. And of course, if you're in it long enough, you understand actually how it functions. 
Um, we'll get into some of the reasons why uh, regulatory agencies are actually hamstrung and confined to what they do because of other reasons I mean, about how the structure works. But in this particular quote, this attorney general's name was Richard Olney. He said to the president of Burlington Railroad, this is in 1893, he said, the Interstate Commerce Commission is or can be made of great help to the railroads. It satisfied the popular clamor of a government supervision of the railroads. At the same time, the supervision is almost entirely nominal. Further, the older such a commission gets to be, the more inclined it will be to take the business and railroad side of things. It thus becomes a sort of barrier between the railroad corporations and the people, and sort of a protection against hasty and crude legislation hostile to railroad interests. Uh, so, to, and, and again, this is a few years back, but it, it in some ways still reflects about how these agencies work, what their intentions were. And again, a lot of the regulatory agencies, at least on the federal level, were modeled after the Interstate Commerce Commission. Um, so to give you some idea of that we think that there's the Department of Ecology, the Department of Environmental Protection, uh, again, those words sometimes don't mean what you think they might mean. That's not to say that some of the work that they do within those agencies isn't good work, but overarchingly, they're caught in a system of which regulations have been written, of which they have to somehow enforce or follow, and that prohibits them, in essence, from doing something bigger than uh, what they're allowed to do. Um, so to kind of get at more of when I say the structure and how it functions, I'm going to do another little diagram here. And again, if we have more time, we take we would take a lot more time to get to this point. But my whole goal is just to give you some semblance of of why it is that we can't say no or yes on the local level. <coughs> so we have something called a box. Of allowable, you can say remedies. Another word that we sometimes use in there is even activism, sort of what, what you're allowed to do. This sort of takes the cliche of in the box and out of the box, but um, it's a simple, easy way to sort of try to describe something that's, in some cases, not simple. So, one of those, and we have, in essence, a box. And you have multiple things outside the box, and there's more than four things, but you have a lot of things outside this box that are forces that want to push you back inside the box, whether you're an activist group, whether you're a community, whatever it is, um, you, you're, meant to be, you're meant to be contained. In essence, you're, you're only allowed certain provisions and remedies within whatever the box says is allowable. And the interesting thing enough is this box is not static, of course, in some cases it's actually shrinking. <coughs> And again, fracking is another great example. Um, we've seen communities who push back on this idea of hydraulic fracturing for, again, all the reasons that we laid out in our triangle. Um, and you've now seen state legislation come forward that actually um, prohibits any sort of local input. And uh, where there's been some local control has been around zoning. So you have zoning laws around setbacks and this and that. That actually revoke those powers even on the local <coughs> level. And they actually use language that explicitly says you cannot prohibit this activity from taking place in the community. You have no control. So in essence, that box will shrink. And there's other things that help shrink this box. In essence, help contain us in our activism and what we think is feasible or allowable and doable. And what we were talking about mainly through the state um, regulatory stuff is, is really state preemption. So in essence, you have state regulatory agencies at the state level that may be linked to something at the federal level that in essence regulates some kind of industry. Um, again, think about anything for the most part, um, it's probably being regulated somehow by a state agency. So in essence, you have state preemption. So what that means is the state preempts you, meaning you the municipality or you the county. So in essence, there's powers that are in the state that not, then they're not within the municipal or county government. And if they are, they've in essence usually been defined and designated by the state itself. Now there have been challenges to say that, well, if you didn't, break, you know, if you didn't define it, then we're gonna take a hold of that and actually use that to push against it. In most of those cases, if there's been a challenge of that nature, the ruling usually comes down on behalf of the state, not on you at the municipal or the county level. So in essence, we have a very, uh, overarching, we have a very preemptive type governmental structure as it stands. We have the federal government, state government, and local government. And so through state regulations, you see the state preempting you at the local. In essence, those regulations are written at the state level, and they actually define how a this is going to take place, not you and your community, even though you're the one that's going to be impacted by it you don't actually write the rules um, from the state perspective. Are the self-death ordinances successful even if there's state preemptive 
regulations? Yeah, so we'll get, in, we'll get into the actual way these are built, why they're built the way they're built, um, what they've been able to do in the short term, what really they're about in the long term. So because, um, uh, really it gets, it's, it's much bigger than whether it's coal, whether it's factory farming, right. we're dealing with structural stuff here. Or another way we say it is mm -hmm. we don't really have a coal problem or a factory farm problem or a sewage sludge problem. We have a democracy problem because if uh, decisions are made by fewer and fewer people these days, mostly in the corporate form, who's deciding for us at the community level. So the question is, are we okay with that? Or do we actually want decision-making power over the health, safety, welfare, growth, sustainability, whatever word you want to throw in there, what our communities look like? And then if that's the case, how do we actually go about restructuring that based upon how the structure operates? So we'll get into that once I kind of get through this um, graph here. Go ahead. Um, I'm not sure if you have an answer to my question, but I think it's an important question. Maybe you don't answer it now, you can answer it sometime later. But um, uh, I'm very concerned about global warming. And uh, one of the proposed solutions is regulation. But, you know, just to making it so that uh, it's a little bit less harmful is, of course, not enough because there could be huge disasters if it goes over a certain point of the return, right? The amount of the you know, gap is too big over at a certain amount of time. And only that, it has to, really has to be done on a worldwide level, which can be done just on a local level by itself, right? Sure. And so, do you have any answer to, if, <laughs> I mean, what would you say about, what would you say about the proposal that, say, the federal government regulate greenhouse gas emissions? Um, well, I guess we can get into it later. Yeah, but, you can get into um, it later, yeah. I mean, it's, it's big, it's complex, it's yeah, messy. It <laughs> I mean, this stuff's been built over a very long time. Yeah. It's not, uh, you know, some people claim it, you know, something economic that happened 20 or 30 years ago or something in the last 10 years or something, as if somehow something just shifted recently. The reality is this stuff's been building one could say over hundreds of years, um, based on how uh, our constitution structure, where our constitution comes from, how things like corporate constitutional rights evolved, how things like the regulatory bodies come into play, how we put commerce and property over really the health, safety, and welfare of us in our natural environment. There's, there's all kind of factors that go into it that aren't only just about where we live, but we also have now pushed things out to such a global level around climate change. You know, it's, it's a big issue that we're dealing with here. And so the work that we'll, we do, we'll walk through how the ordinances are structured is really is the first steps about what could be possible. Um, but understanding in some ways that we have to take action on where we live. And in some ways, um, we're only left with the possibility of doing things where we live because things are pretty insulated at the state legislative level, level at the federal level, at the international level. So. The question is, how do you build a movement that's strong enough to bring down that structure and put something else in place? And that's, that's the big unknown at the moment. I also heard that if a state has a preemption, like you say there, and the municipalities pass certain uh, laws, then uh, the, the police and the state or the law enforcement has what is called a crisis of jurisdiction. They have to decide whether they're going to protect the, 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 law, the decision that the municipality has reached or what the state is trying to force upon them. Yeah, I mean, you have policing powers at the state level that could. So then there could be a conflict. You could, even though the state says one thing and the state preempts the, the, what's inside the state, there could be a case in which the, the, the towns or the counties are fighting back to, against this. It, it's uh, that's the, the crisis of jurisdiction. So any other hands at the moment? So state preemption is one of these forces that will drive in the box. Another thing that we hear about a lot um, lately and different groups are mobilized against this notion of corporate rights. So most recently, of course, the whole idea of um, the Supreme Court decision about unlimited spending in uh, political arena by anybody, <coughs> most specifically corporations, um, is about First Amendment rights. Of course, in the Constitution, statewide as well as federally, we have a Bill of Rights. Um, and corporations basically have the same rights that you and I do. They have Bill of Rights protections. 
that's not just the First Amendment, uh, but they have Fourth Amendment right protections, Fifth Amendment, Sixth Amendment, Fourteenth Amendment right protections. And how these come into play is that if you, on a state level or you, on a local level, put something in place that violates those rights, guess what the lawsuit has included within it's the fact that you've violated our rights. Me, you meaning me, the corporation. So uh, uh, one of the things they could sue on is that you violated the 14th Amendment, uh, my 14th Amendment rights, equal protection under the law. Because what you could say is we think farming looks like this, and now you're saying you're not allowed to get this kind of farming in, in essence, you violated our 14th Amendment rights. Because corporations have those rights under the Constitution. Which is another thing when I say the arrow is going in. It's another thing that keeps us inside the box because we don't invariably want to step out because you're going to step right into something like corporate constitutional rights. And also, you're most likely going to step into something called state preemption uh, as well. Um, sort of tied to that, but sometimes we put it um, separate, which is another thing that's a hot issue right now uh, are things like the Commerce Clause. In the US Constitution, you have something called the Commerce Clause which basically says that it's Congress's power to regulate all commerce. So in essence, <coughs> the power is solely in that of Congress, not you as a community, not you at the state level, not you at the county level. That's Congress's purview, that's Congress's arena in essence. And so how that actually translates to, for instance, the corporate interest um, is they will use the Commerce Clause as a way to make sure that there isn't laws being put in place that create a barrier for them to do their business. An example, um, in the state of Virginia, who was starting to get a lot of out-of-state waste, so waste management corporation, uh, was bringing in out-of-state waste and dumping it in landfills in Virginia. And they were starting to realize that they were running out of landfill space, and they had their own trash to figure out how to get rid of the problem in itself. But, so they basically said, well, we can't really in the long term allow out-of-state waste to come in and manage our own waste, so we're going to put a law in place that actually helped, um, makes, prohibits out-of-state waste from coming into Virginia landfills. Well, lo and behold, Waste Management Corporation says, you know, hold on a second, you can't do that, because by doing so, you're violating the Commerce Clause in the U.S. Constitution, because you're, a, you're the state, you're not the federal Congress, you can't make laws interfering with commerce. Interstate commerce. Interstate, well, it even goes deeper than that. But, um, meaning that waste, in essence, can be defined as commerce. And now you, the state, have said, we're not going to allow this kind of commerce, but we're going to allow, in essence, this kind of commerce. You've now violated the Commerce Clause. So it's another thing that keeps us, in essence, inside the box, is if you step out of that and actually want to define, in essence, what you think is a more viable commerce, let's say, in your own community, you're more than likely going to run into the Commerce Clause if someone thinks otherwise. Usually the someone is the corporate interest that's going to challenge you on the notion that you have the ability to put a law like that in place. Our states aren't allowed to enact their own tariffs, are they? Like, so basically, if they didn't want you know, any kind of waste coming from other states, they could just say really high, <coughs> just tariffs against that. Or is that that's yeah? I and mean, you'd be running into um, you know federal preemption on that. Um, you'd also potentially be running into things like the contracts clause, which is also part of the Constitution. So anything you might be able to think of to sort of do those kind of things, more than likely, is going to run into something structurally that's going to preempt you. Um, another thing of which affects us here at the local level is something called Dillon's Rule. Has anybody heard of Dillon's Rule? So, have you? Yeah, I'm from Virginia. Oh, okay. Um, so Dillon's Rule um, is basically this legal, it's a legal doctrine, it's not legislation, but it's basically been adopted by almost all the states as, as being law. So this is another way in which law is made that, in essence, is another force against us at the local level. The way to think of Dillon's rule is that <coughs> Dillon's rule, it's talking about the relationship between the state and the municipal government or the county government. And the way that to think about Dillon's rule is that the state government is the parent and the local government is the child. <coughs> the child is only allowed to do what the parent says it can do. So in essence, all the power that gets down to the municipal level is granted by this, is in essence granted or chartered by the state. And so powers can be given, the powers can be unilaterally taken away. So in essence, you have no choice what things may look like on the local level because the state actually over, overrules you, or in essence, with Dillon's rule, supersedes you. 
And we saw that come into play uh, two summers ago, I think it was, in Michigan. There was some financial issues going on. <coughs> the state government said that there's some mismanagement of finances happening at the local level. And they actually went in there and actually pushed aside the whole city governmental operations and actually appointed a private administrator to administrate the affairs of the community. <laughs> so um, to show you how Dillon's rule works, that's an example of how Dillon's rule works because the state can do so. It can take powers away and it can grant powers. In that case, it took powers away for the own government to run its affairs and actually put a state administrator in place um, to do so. And in fact, Dillon went so far as to say that there's really no reason even to elect local officials because all that the local all, all the local government is is an administrative arm <coughs> of the state. So when we look at what's, all, what's that? All the it's an administrative arm of the state. There's no reason, in his view, John Dillon, the guy that wrote this document, there's even no reason to elect your local officials because all the municipal government is is an extension of the state. And and again, when we when we're dealing with issues like factory farms or whatever it is that may come up that we don't want, this is another thing that you're going to run into this idea of Dillon's rule. Um, another thing, just to throw it out there, as it stands today, under law, nature is property. So we have a property view of nature. Nature has no rights. Um, it's seen strictly as property. And in most cases, um, really what it comes down to is you can do pretty much what you want if you own the property. And that's how we have private property rights and the power of how that private property rights comes into play. <coughs> surprise, surprise, who owns the most land besides government? Well, it's corporations. So in essence, they're allowed to do what they want because we view nature as it stands as property. So even environmental laws are all pinned to this idea of property. In fact, most of the environmental laws that were passed on the federal level, they only exist within our structure of law and government because they're related to the Commerce Clause. So the, to show the power that commerce is, even your environmental laws are associated with um, with commerce, um, environmental laws associated with commerce. Even the civil rights laws that were passed in the 60s, the only reason they exist is they're actually related to commerce. Because when the, when the civil rights amendments were passed, um, the 13th, 14th, and 15th amendments, there were laws actually passed by the federal government to actually make those amendments real, which was about not allowing uh, inns or restaurants or theaters to deny African Americans the right to access those services. Um, the cases that came out of it eventually said, well, government can actually can't do that because the, those are private businesses, they're not government. So in essence, it made those constitutional amendments pretty much null and void. They have no power. And so when the civil rights movement sort of flared up again, not that it actually moved one way, but when it kind of came to the head in the 60s, the reason why we were able to put in those laws, the Civil Rights Act of the 60s, is because they managed to find a place for it, and the place that they hung it on was Congress. In essence, saying, well, you can't deny an African American right of passage on a bus because you're affecting commerce. <coughs> so, even even the good stuff that we try to do to protect the environment or civil rights, a lot of it still is all geared towards this idea of, of in essence, protecting commerce first and foremost. And if it happens to protect civil rights, then it happens to protect civil rights. And again, not to make light of the civil rights effort and what went down, especially with yesterday being the anniversary of, of King's assassination, but. Just to show you structurally again how things operate, uh, this is again coming out of constitutional structure. Um, there's other things that also on um, the outside area that we won't get into, but basically to say is besides that regulatory system, which is again how a lot of our activism and our, our focus goes to, which is related to state preemption, these are some of the other things that keep us in essence with inside the box. In essence, telling you don't step outside the box, because if you do, you're going to get hammered by one in most cases, all of these things. And there's lawsuits uh, through communities that we work with that basically name all this stuff. When they do, and the corporate interests, when they, when they sue a community, they don't leave anything out. <laughs> because if something else gets struck, they can grab onto something else in the process. So they're, they're not shy about when they sue a community to make sure that they, shoot, they, that they sue on all these grounds. Well, I have a question about nature's property. I, I mean, I've heard that, you know, water, air, even wildlife, since it doesn't stay on one piece of property, is pretty much publicly, it's like a public domain, a, a commons, that it moves, and it travels. Is that, I mean... I think that's a view, but... Is that a loophole Well, the, the legal structure doesn't recognize it that way. The legal um, structure, that which, which you mean the constitution? The environmental laws, 
environmental laws or the regulations around regulating water. It's about it's about our human relationship to those things, but it's not about nature for nature's sake. Well, it's a right for uh, people to have. Well, water. it's a right. It's a right it's around how you might be affected by something that's affected the environment. So, for instance, mm -hmm. to get standing sometimes on environmental issues, you may have to show personal harm because right. well, my water's been polluted so it's polluted so bad that I've been harmed by it, and I can prove it. Okay. It's about proving the environmental damage of which that has damaged you. It's never about the ecosystems for the ecosystem's right, sake right. and all the other things that rely on the fact that it needs something healthy well, water. Obviously, healthy it's very important. Yeah. yeah, so that's in essence when we say nature is, uh, has no right to nature's property, it's within that frame. Mm -hmm. Even though I guess when we, maybe when we think about it, we want to think about it differently, but how the law treats it. And, and again, we're not the only country, but every country treats nature in that same manner. Mm -hmm. In some ways, people say that's part of why we have the environmental conditions we do is because we have, in essence, elevated the environment to the point of being protected from a rights-based standpoint. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's that's why I put that nature as property piece is another thing that, that kind of keeps us in the condition we're at. In uh, Eugene, there's an environmental group that is campaigning to restrict timber barons from aerial application of herbicides. And the argument that they are using is it is illegal under state law to have the chemicals trespass across property line. So they can spray whatever they want on their land, but if it crosses the property line, then it's illegal, although enforcing that is really impossible. But they won't take the position to say it should be banned and they should not be allowed to spray this stuff. They're using a sort of disingenuous argument, oh, well, we're just trying to stop the chemical trespass. They are looking into it, they're going to work with it. Well, um... You might have a problem, right? That's what I'm trying to say. Well, it would be nice to see a shift on that, because there is no way to have community because of all these factors as it stands today. And so the communities who've, who've passed new law, in essence, said, we don't have remedy and if we're actually going to eventually potentially get there, we have to step out of the structure as it stands and challenge in some ways the structure and the law. But say like that pyramid was turned upside down. I mean, that's technically not dismantling the system, but it's completely reversing it. Um, well, in some ways, that's kind of what the proposal is. By actually taking the structure on, it is about flipping the triangle. That's a good way to look at it. But when you flip that triangle, that, that is the, the same, that's the same thing as stepping outside the box, because you're not allowed to flip the triangle, because the triangle's been built a certain way to operate a certain way. And when you want to flip the triangle, you run into all these forces in this box that allow the remedies that are going to jam you back in that box, because you don't have the authority to flip the triangle. So it's a, it's a hard issue sometimes to wrap our heads around, because, again, it gets so much bigger than maybe the initial threat of which has rallied us, whether it's coal trains or something else, because we have a deeper structural problem that has to be addressed um, if we're truly about changing the structure for the various reasons that communities have come to the conclusion that we need to. Um, so that kind of runs into sort of what communities are doing. And so, again, this is all being fired at you pretty fast. We usually let people in the workshops have a little more time to get to this, but even then, it's sometimes a little bit overwhelming, um, but I just wanted to give folks at least a quick snapshot of, of what it what it really looks like, and you know, especially when it's dealing with some serious issues in our community, whether it's food, whether it's energy, whether it's development, I and mean, all that stuff runs into that that regulatory triangle for the most part, and it's going to run into all these these forces that are going to want to keep us in the box for the most part as well. All operates pretty much the same. And so as I was saying, com communities, um, we as an organization and communities have decided actually we have to start doing something differently. And so um, we started writing, in essence, new law on behalf of these communities. So the communities looked at us and said, well, we need new law, and we need to help us with this. Um, so the very first uh, sort of evolution of these laws took place in 2002 and 2003. Um, and they were mainly focused at, um, at really the, the, the corporate rights piece. Um, over time, we began to add in all the other elements, but they really were kind of focused on this idea of corporate rights. And so you had small townships that were passing, in essence, anti-corporate farming laws that said, well, we're going to validate um, 
you know, family farm corporations, but not big agriculture coming in to dictate what farming is going to look like. We're going to actually exclude those. And to exclude those, we have to invalidate this idea of corporate constitutional rights, of which they're going to try to wield against us. And so you have two townships that actually passed these laws. They were the first ones to actually pass the legally binding law to say corporations aren't, don't, aren't to be seen as people under the law. So they were the first ones to actually pass local law to take on that notion that corporations are persons. Uh, over time, like I said, uh, as we start to learn more, that also worked its way into democracy schools, but within the laws themselves, the laws actually evolved to actually take on all these other elements. And so what you see today is really um, the, the accumulation of that, of that work uh, with communities to get the laws into that position. <coughs> Before I kind of <coughs> talk about that, excuse me, just to give you some idea of what, when I say you get hammered when you step outside the box, Eventually, um, a number of these communities passed uh, similar laws to those first two communities, but slightly different. <clears throat> and enough of them passed it, there were 80 or 100 communities that passed these laws in Pennsylvania to say no to corporate farming or no to corporate sludging in their communities. Um, that the reaction um, wasn't uh, solely about litigation, so in essence the corporation coming in and suing the community saying you can't do this, sorry, for all these reasons, you know, thanks for playing. Um, but they actually went to, they took legislative action. So in essence, the corporations, the big ag industry in Pennsylvania, went to the state legislature, and they drove in a, a whole new law. So they were responsible for driving in that Nutrient Management Act thing to make it easier for them to do their factory farms in the first place. And then when, corp when towns still were pushing back against this notion of factory farming, they went back to the state again to pass a new law. Uh, and that new law uh, did a couple of, uh, did actually uh, a, a new thing that hadn't really been done before because previous to that, it was about the corporation coming to you and your community and suing you. So it was about private enforceability of the law, which is how most law tends to work. So the corporation had to spend time and money. Now, I would say have to spend time and money. The reality is corporations use uh, their, their legal expenses as a, as a, as a, as a normal operation as yes, tax deductible. So uh, and for a while we thought we were costing corporations money by spending time that, that that's actually all tax deductible. So the beauty of this new law, I'm going to say beauty again from their perspective, because okay, they're always thinking and looking at how to do things easier for themselves. And they're kind of like water, they go with these resistances. So they go to the state. And they passed this new law, and the, the basic premise of the new law was to, in essence, make it illegal for, for towns to pass anti-corporate farming laws. So they were explicit about saying you cannot pass anti-corporate farming laws. And not only can you pass that, but we are now going to put the state attorney general in a position to sue your municipality if you do so. Okay? So it's a radical shift, because it was no longer about the corporation having to come and sue you. Now your own state government is going to come and sue you, because you put a law in place that they say, that they say is illegal. So in essence, the attorney general can come into your town and say, well, you have a law that actually is a violation of state law, and we're going to sue you. So it's, it's not just the corporation anymore, but it's the state itself. And the reason why that's important is to show, in essence, how the broader structure works. That it's not just the corporation, but how the corporation uses something like the state government, in essence, is another corporate right. There's another way you can expand out that notion of corporate rights. It's not just geared towards bill of rights protections, but it ends up being a right of the corporation when they pass such things at the state level. Um, and so the state, in a couple of cases, came in and sued municipalities for having these laws. Um, from our end, um, it ends up doing something of which we can never do on our own. So what we try to describe this to communities or people. Um, sometimes they don't see it. And sometimes you have to actually get hit over the head with it before you, you understand what, what things are really about, how they really function. In some ways, that, that law actually ended up being a good thing. It ended up being kind of an organizing tool. Because one of the things that came out of it is when the state came in and actually sued one of these townships in Pennsylvania, in the legal brief that was prepared by the Attorney General's office, um, that Attorney General is now the governor of the state of Pennsylvania. Um, he, in the uh, very, I think it was the first paragraph I got over here me, he basically said there is no inalienable right to local self-government. So you had the state of Pennsylvania telling people in the local townships, you know, again, even if you want to protect your health, safety, and welfare, well, you can't, because there is no inalienable right to local self-government. So it was your own top legal official saying you can't do this because you have no right to do it. And so people can either say, okay, thanks, and then go away, or they could use that to say, well, 
wait a second, I thought all political power was inherent in the people. Why don't we have the rights to protect our community and say that we want this kind of farming versus that kind of farming? So those communities use it as, as, as an, uh, an organizing tool to get other communities to pass similar laws. So in essence, they're being defined under the current structure, much like, again, the abolitionists said we can't find remedy under the current structure. And so if we're going to change it, we can't actually justify it by living under it, but we have to actually establish something new. <clears throat> and again, so what's come out of that is this evolution of, of lawmaking that we've helped communities with that have again gone to other issues, whether it's corporate water uh, withdrawal, whether it's uh, fracking, whether it's the factory farm stuff. And actually, we've begun to write new law that actually puts rights at the center. So this idea of community rights at the center. In the process, it may ban a certain corporate activity from taking place, and then it nullifies all those forces that want to jam you inside the box. And so another way to look at these local laws, knowing that they're being defiant to the system, is in essence being disobedient to what the system says is allowable, um, another way we try to frame it is by doing these things on the local level, you're blueprinting what may be possible at, at higher levels or on more expanded levels. It gives, in essence, a blueprint of what could be uh, taking place um, at the state level or at the federal level. Because uh, to kind of move into where this stuff is going to go, it's going to take thousands of communities to do something similar on the local level to actually have enough force to crack things at the state level to eventually have things to crack at the federal level. And so this is ultimately where this stuff is moving to. And whatever brings the community together around the issues, whether it's coal trains or something else, is the understanding the structure operates in a certain manner. And so you're taking on, in essence, the structure itself to just show others what the structure looks like, to begin to sort of envision what it would look like to crack things to a different level, to recognize the environment differently, to recognize local self-government differently, to recognize who actually has decision-making power in the place where you live. How far are you from being able to uh, draft a state like, um, you know, like Vermont is being sued possibly by Monsanto, which would go ahead with their GMO uh, yeah. labeling. And has anyone been tracking that particular case? No. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a corporate rights thing. It's basically saying not only do you have the right to speak, but you have the right not to speak. So if you're a corporation, you have First Amendment rights. And so the labeling law they're contending is a violation of their right not to speak. So they want to have a disclosure or a right to know law around GMO stuff. And this issue came up around uh, RGBH, the uh, bovine growth hormone. The same issue came up around trying to label things as having bovine growth hormone, of which it was struck down again because you'd be violating the corporation's First Amendment right to not to speak. So from a legal perspective, that's what the argument is that's going on. And more than likely, if the corporation is going to win on behalf of that First Amendment right that they have, in essence, the right not to speak by having the disclosure of the GMO Against stuff. the state. Sure. So, so how, how far are you from being able to write something at the state level? Can you guys do that? Or well, is that possible? I mean, you know, for them, those representatives to take <coughs> your um, piece of language and implement so I mean, it at the state level. So any state could do it now if they have the political will and notion to do so. There's nothing that's, that's stopping them from doing it. Um, the question is, you know, will they do it? In our view, we don't see any state legislator willing to do anything. But like maybe nature. Vermont, like if they were... Maybe. Again, there's yeah. nothing that's stopping them. We've talked with people in Vermont. Oh, you did? Yeah, yeah. We, we, so they're not interested. There's, yeah, I mean, it's, you're playing in a different world, and a, a number of us come from the state legislator level, and we've seen uh -huh. how state legislators operate. Uh -huh. And so that's why we have more hope in the community level than we see at the state level currently. Uh -huh. Now, where this stuff is potentially leading to is in, in Pennsylvania, you've had enough communities do this kind of new lawmaking, that now those individuals and those individual communities, whatever issue they came to get to this conclusion, um, regardless of what the issue was, meaning if they were people who were against fracking or people against factory farming, um, they understood the structural stuff. Those people are actually coming together to actually try to drive in a constitutional convention within the state of Pennsylvania to amend their state constitution to drive in elements that would take on these forces that keep us from actually deciding what our communities look like. Now, there's still a ways off from that, but eventually that needs to happen. And it's not unprecedented. 
I mean, other people's movements, that's happening <coughs> too. The abolitionists drove things at the local and state level. Uh, suffragists did the same thing. Actually, Oregon was, I think I just read the other day, one of two states by uh, initiative that actually put in women's right to vote. Mm -hmm. um, to show you how this stuff actually builds. In fact, on um, Monday, uh, the city of Las Vegas, New Mexico, put a bill of rights in place that prohibited fracking. And the council member that was uh, one of the three that actually voted for it, um, against the one who dissented, said, well, this is us actually showing the federal government how it needs to be. So in essence, we're taking a stance to protect our community and also to show where we need to be heading as, uh, as a country. In essence, that was the basic summation of, of that person's words about where this stuff goes. Are we there yet? No. Nope. Um, can we get there? Who knows? Um, how do we get there? I think there's probably multiple ways, but the idea of this one is it's about seizing, in essence, who runs your government and what government is for and taking control and using that lever of lawmaking to actually force this stuff out there, which is what Las Vegas did, these other 140, 50 communities now have done, uh, as the possibility of what could be. Um, but we're, I think, a long way off still from that kind of stuff. Right. Um, back in the late 1980s and early 1990s, we had the effort to stop food radiation which was to expose food to nuclear waste. Some of it even was going to come from Hanford. Um, beneficial, beneficial uses Local of local resource, uh, nuclear byproducts. And the way we stopped it was we found that petitioning the government and even getting some local ordinances through was almost a waste of time. We raised the issue, but legally it had zero impact. We went after the corporations. We went after Miceroni. We went after McCormick, Spice, we went after a couple others, and they all got nervous. And a friend of mine took out an ad in the hometown paper of uh, Hormel, which makes Spam. And so the only thing worse than Spam is the radiated Spam. <laughs> he did that on the day of their, of their shareholder meeting. So they all got to see it. And it was bad PR that forced them, they were hoping for a thousand radiated by the year 2000, I think they got to be. So, I mean, that's how some wins have come to be. What we need to understand is there was a choice made, an economic choice. There was, there was no structural change to what you did. You may have stopped that particular practice, but nothing structurally is, is going to keep them potentially from actually putting that in place if they wanted, for instance. So you put, you put guilt pressure on them, but structurally nothing has changed around actually who decides whether you get that or not. And so this is the kind of work that these communities are doing. It's actually going after the structure and not just about pressuring um, from an economic standpoint or a public relations standpoint for somebody not to engage in something that is bad. Well, part of the pressure that's put on Monsanto is Monsanto, unless you're buying herbicides, it's really hard to boycott. And there's not similar pressure, I mean, I agree with you completely, but there's not similar pressure in boycotting Frito-Lays and all the others that are using franken corn. Or terms of I'm sure franken is better. There's not a big pressure campaign. They have not suffered for that. And so they've converted most of the corn and soy and the sugar beets and the rest. Sure. And again, that's why I said there, there may be, there's a need for, for other efforts like, you know, getting people not to buy it, let's say. But then understanding is still that if we don't take on the structure itself, we're going to continue to get, if it's not cranking right boots, it's going to be something else that keeps coming up. If we're still in a situation in which a minority that is deciding for the majority, and in most cases now it's the corporate interests that are actually deciding what our food system looks like, what our energy looks like, um, what our uh, you know our development within our community looks like. And so the question that communities then come to, whether it's this one or any other one, is you know do you want that kind of a model, or are you actually looking for something different? If you're looking for something different, invariably you're going to have to go against the structure itself to put something new in place. And so that's kind of where we're at. And so in some ways, it's, it's, again, it's a recognition that stuff is built over time. It's very well built. It's, you know, we used to say that the system's broken, but the reality is the system actually works perfectly well um, because that's how it's been built to work. Um, and again, it's, in some cases, it's very difficult to see. You don't see all these pieces generally uh, unless you know, you're really into it, you're analyzing it, or you get sued by it or whatever it is. It's very difficult to see all this stuff. So that's what communities are up against. So if you get some, some magnitude of what this really means, that's the step outside the box. In some ways, it's also, you got to give yourself a little bit of permission to understand that, well, this stuff's been around a while, and it's going to take a while to actually take it down. Um, sometimes we use like a, a 
a, a metaphor to say, you know, if there's a, a football game going on, the score's five gajillion to zero, <laughs> and uh, they have all the points, and the reality is we haven't even gotten on the field yet. So, I mean, the kind of scope of what we're up against when you start to actually look at trying to dismantle the structure. And when you do that, you, you usually, again, like you say, you get hit. So those communities that try to put laws and to keep corporate factory farming out, they got hit by the state now. It says, well, we're going to sue you. Or in the fracking world now, Pennsylvania and Idaho and some other states have actually put laws in place that have pulled any sort of local power away from decisions on natural gas drilling and prohibited them from banning it. Or in the city of Spokane, because there's a citizens group that actually tried to propose legislation in the sort of Bill of Rights framework, um, they got hammered by the people who, in essence, run the community, and there was actually an attempt to overhaul the initiative process in the city itself to make it more difficult to do direct legislation. So when you step out, um, invariably somebody is going to usually come after you to try to, to, in essence, correct your behavior, to make sure you get back inside the box, because there's a rhyme and reason for things, and, you know, and don't be messing with it, basically, is what it comes down to. Um, but this is, in essence, how the system works. And so when communities uh, look to do a Bill of Rights that may also you know, ban the coal trains or a Bill of Rights that are about banning tracking, um, again, it's bigger than just um, the ban. It's also about the assertions of the rights piece and then taking on all these other elements that force us back inside the box. All right, so what do we do? <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's, and it, it comes down to a community. I mean, we, we come in and I can do a workshop or I can teach a longer democracy school, I can share a lot more stories, but uh, it comes down to what the community uh, will is and what the community feels it wants to do. Uh, and then our work usually is about, you know, helping from the legal perspective or helping some degrees to the, to the organizing perspective, but um, this stuff only bubbles up from the place itself. It's not, it's never dropped in on you. It's not like we come in and actually tell a community what to do. Well, we want to stop the coal trains from coming through your and we have a lot of reasons why that we think that's bad because of the, the dust that spills off, it's stopping the trains, uh, the ambulance is going by the train. So, so how can we, well, so what, you, what remedies do we have against uh, them bringing a coal train for using the trains in this area to bring coal <coughs> to who's bay? So you have, again, the regulatory structure. You've got this box that you're dealing with. That's what they got, what we got. Well, mm -hmm. you, this is what you have, too. This is how your, your options are shaped. So you have an example now in the city of Bellingham, which has actually put forward a Bill of Rights that prohibits the coal trains from coming through Bellingham. So they're actually, at the moment, petitioning to qualify this. <coughs> and it actually then takes on the structure to say, that we have more rights at the community level. It's in essence that community rights supersede that of corporate rights. And that's what they're putting forward to in essence take on the, the train issue. So they're not, that group's not willing to go down the regulatory route. They're actually going down sort of the rights-based framework route and actually trying to take on the structure to expose the structure for what it is. And where are they with that? They're still gathering signatures that are qualified, <laughs> yeah. So um, you have something to model it up after. Um, so that's something of which the group here, if there's you know, interest in will, and I, I think there's some people that want to do it, um, that they could actually use to actually put forth and, and potentially go through the same process as telling them. You said that uh, when you were talking earlier that uh, corporations, the corporations can pass laws to, to, to inhibit what uh, the activists are trying to do. Why is it they can pass laws so much easier than we can pass laws to stop them? Why do you, I mean, why because do you of money? Money. money? They're much better organized. Well, well, definitely has something to do with it. Um, I would say the way that they're organized has something to do with it. I mean, the reality is there's corporate attorneys. There's a, a group of corporate attorneys, I think, from various industries that actually meet, uh, I think, on a weekly basis. And they have discussions about what's happening around the country on different issues. Alec. And they use those discussions then to figure out what they need to do to make sure that their commercial practices continue as uninhibited as possible. And so, who are the judges? So they're very well organized, they're very well connected, and they've got the wealth to animate all that. Mm -hmm. um, and that's all things that we don't have, which is another reason why we say that this work has the best possibility of taking root at the local level is, uh, is that insulation is usually less so at the local level. You, know, you still have some of that kind of same influence. You don't have it to the magnitude and the degree that you do at the state and the federal level. 
So um, even knowing that that has to change at some point, the question is how do you build enough momentum or enough of a movement to actually crack it? And in our view, it's about communities actually stepping out and enough communities doing it to be enough of a force where you can't be ignored. Maybe what people are missing is like, uh, like maybe sort of talking about the structure of the, the ordinances themselves, like how they first strip the rights of the corporations. I, you know what I mean? Like I know, because I've heard this before and I'm working on one with you guys, but maybe they don't know. Yeah, I mean the, the basic structure. frame is it's about asserting rights. That becomes the core of what you're putting forward. So it could be the rights to clean air, clean water, the rights of the, the natural ecosystems, this idea of the rights to local self-government. And they get shaped differently depending on what the community is looking and wanting to do. Uh, then usually the next layer is about prohibiting something in most cases. So it would be about banning the coal train, abuse the coal train is the issue. Uh, the next thing is about nullifying corporate constitutional rights, saying that you, the corporations, can't use that as a legal tool to tell us, in essence, to usurp those rights, or nullify those rights, we're going to actually pull your corporate constitutional rights away. It also goes after state preemption, or any kind of federal preemption, the state will become null and void, um, because those will also be violations of our rights. It takes on things like Dillon's rule with the self-government pronouncement, uh, Commerce Law is also wrapped into the with corporate constitutional rights. So in essence, it's understanding that if this is how the system operates, then you have to take on all those different elements within the laws that you pass. And part of the reason to do that is this idea that if they do get challenged, um, that you actually begin to actually have real discussions on how things actually work. Meaning in the regulatory world, the regulatory world is about parts per million and traffic patterns and all that kind of stuff, or noise level, or you know, pesticide drift. And so you start talking about all these other things about the practice of which has been allowed, which you really don't want to allow in the first place, but all you're allowed to do is, is kind of mitigate the harms and all that stuff. So then all your discussions are about that kind of stuff, but never about how the actual decision making <coughs> structure really works. And so when you structure your laws to actually get out how the decision making structure works, then the corporation actually has to come in and tell you that their rights supersede yours, or that the state has more power than you do to decide what the community looks like, even if you think what's happening is bad for your health, safety, and welfare. So you start to have those discussions not only in the courts, but hopefully you start having those discussions out in the community, and then broader than that, the broader society to understand you know, can we live under this system, both from a human justice standpoint, but also for an environmental justice standpoint, because um, of the pressure that we know that we're living under environmentally right now, you know, how much longer do we really have if we keep doing what we keep doing? I mean, a simple way that we look at it, besides the commerce and property having so much power, is that we have, in essence, a system that believes in the endless production of more. Mm -hmm. And that constantly gets validated, whether it's the food system, whether it's energy, whatever it is, we keep validating that system with all of this stuff. So whether it's legal doctrines, whether it's the constitutional structures, whether it's judge-made law, it all gets validated. And so that's, that's the world we live in, and that's the machine of which we're all part of right now. So the question is, you know, do we want to be a part of that, knowing what we know from the evidence that says that kind of stuff is actually killing us, literally? Um, we have to, in essence, take on the machine of which we're all driving it currently. And unfortunately, it's not enough for us to voluntarily do things either individually or in small collectives, because when you add that a lot, it's still not enough, because the predominant dominant system is still subscribing to this endless production of war mentality. And that, uh, so it doesn't really matter to some level what we do individually, even though that's important, we need to do all that stuff as it stands. We have to actually go after the structural stuff to put something new in place, um, of which hopefully means a better survival for us and the natural environment that we rely on. Um, I had a question. Um, I know there's a lot of resistance to mount top removal, you know, direct action, civil disobedience. I mean, I mean, do you feel that's an effective tool to, uh, you know, sway the public and, and manipulate politicians to doing what, yep. what yeah, is right? In some ways you don't know. Um, I think a lot of our activists have been sat in there. And so in our view, we have to get, again, at the structural stuff beyond mm -hmm. just, um, the, that kind of protesting. Mm -hmm. The unfortunate thing with that kind of protesting is if you're caught doing whatever it is you're doing, then the criminal justice system can yeah, come crashing down on you. Um, so uh, in some ways, people view this as, as collective civil, you know, co collective nonviolent civil disobedience by using the rule of law actually to go after 
how law works in a mm -hmm. collective way versus an individual sort of protest way. Well, what if you start shutting down corporate headquarters and, and Congress? Yeah, like and I said, I mean, there's other things that you know, <laughs> people may want to try. We may need to ratchet up those things to that level. Mm -hmm. um, you know, our work's pretty much focused on, you know, even when you do that, eventually you have to get at to a different structure. And what does that structure really look like? So it's about sort of, in essence, like I said, blueprinting what may be possible and using the local to give examples of what the state and federal eventually can look at. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, there may be still need, obviously, to do other things at the same time, knowing the urgency that we're living under. Mm -hmm. um, but what we see right now is not enough communities going after this, and people still living a little bit much into the conventional world, even though some of the, the, the radicals are, are still doing um, stuff differently. Most of the, the organizing is, is fairly conventional that sits within the box or within the regulatory system itself, still thinking that there's still remedy under that system. Mm -hmm. uh, and what our experiences and other communities' experiences is that's not where the remedy is. It's because we have these deep structural problems, and we have to take the structure on, you know, directly. There's that. So I apologize, but I want to take us back in the conversation a little bit. Sure. Where you said that some legislation or rights <coughs> was passed, and then the state passed a law that said you can't do that, and then are suing the community. Mm -hmm. Now what happens? Um, so, in, in, there's a couple of cases that came out of it. So, just to kind of give a ratio of the 140 or so of these laws that have passed, uh, there's been about five or six that have been challenged. In two cases, one of them being the case of which the state came down, that community decided to rescind their law. In essence, they, they, they did, they, they crumbled to the pressure of the state and decided not to fight uh, from a legal perspective. Um, there's at least two cases that are in the courts currently um, that are still fighting the, the notion that they don't have the ability to have local lawmaking. So those cases are unresolved. But the other reality is we don't expect the courts to sort of rule on, on behalf of the communities because of the way that the structure works. Because from a legal perspective, this is all well-settled law. So in essence, you're trying to unsettle or, un, un, or topple well-settled law that usually doesn't work within uh, the courts, the judges, you know, they look at they look at precedent, they look at well-settled law because it makes it easier for them to make their decisions. And so, in some ways, uh, the courts aren't are going to be what makes the change, um, but they can help. In essence, if you flood the courts with thousands of these cases, but also another way to say is you can't ignore the fact of how the structure works. And why isn't that we're not allowed to, in essence, decide for ourselves? And why is it just the minority corporate interest or the board of directors deciding for us? So you kind of elevate that. So it's not to say that. Court cases are bad. At the same time, people need to realize it's probably not the courts that are going to make the aha decision to say, "Oh yeah, corporate rights are wrong, and state preemption is wrong, and the commerce clause is all messed up." Um, it's, it's probably not going to happen through through the courts itself. So it's, it's again, it's a different way to begin to think about what is it that we want in essence, and if we want something differently, can you really get it under this particular structure? And if you can't, then what are you going to do about actually? getting there, so in essence, you need to lay a new sort of path for yourselves, whether it's the community or a state eventually, or, or a nation. Uh, again, knowing how this stuff is built. And again, we didn't go into deeper details about where a lot of this stuff comes from. You know, our own country's constitution comes from English common law, which is what we lived under before the Revolutionary War, and we all kind of thought we were going for something different, but lo and behold, Ten some years later, after the first constitution was passed, we went to what we have today in the U.S. Constitution, which is very similar to what we had prior to the Revolution. So there's that kind of learning that we have to maybe go back to in our own history to sort of break some myths about where this stuff really comes from, and what it means, and do we really have democracy, and all that kind of discussion, um, and how, in essence, even things like the power of Congress, you know, have been really DNA'd into things like the Constitution and the effects of it all. And we see the, the power of commerce, obviously, through uh, the energy gold rush that's going on, through how uh, big agriculture operates. So all that stuff uh, is very real in our today's world. But part of what we try to do in democracy schools is, is get people to go back in time, in essence, to understand where all this stuff comes from. Again, it's just a, another um, reinforcement of, of why this stuff is structural. Um, the Constitution is one piece of that system and that structure. I guess that kind of touches on what I was going to ask. I mean, because I instinctively, I, I agree with what you're saying with the influence of, of corporations and shaping 
uh, the legal system, but how do you how do you prove that to people who aren't already, you know, who don't already believe that? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a actually a really good question. I mean, we, we work with communities, in, in Pennsylvania you have in small towns, they're called townships, and you have township supervisors. There's usually three township supervisors um, to each of these townships, and we were working with one of these townships on, a, on one of these ordinances, and uh, we had written this idea of, of corporate constitutional rights and the need to actually challenge that notion that corporations have these rights. And you know, when, you ex when we were explaining it to these township supervisors, they were, you know, like, what does that mean? You know, that sounds theoretical, and you know, that must, must be from law school, but that doesn't exist in the real world. And in their case, it wasn't until they were sued, <laughs> and the lawsuit actually named those constitutional rights that corporations had that they actually, you know, slapped themselves in the head and said, oh, now we know what you mean by corporate constitutional rights. So it's, it's not an easy thing even now to discuss with people about what does that really mean and how does that really affect us. Because you don't really see it. And again, at least unless you're immersed in it or you actually see the lawsuit or you see the effects of it, um, these kinds of discussions aren't easy to have. They've, they've gotten a little bit easier with, I think, the Citizens United case has kind of got people thinking. Um, I think the Occupy movement itself sort of cracked things to a degree. And so some of this stuff becomes a little easier to talk about, but it's still not a very easy thing to sort of paint this picture. Because within all that, I think there are certain myths about how we think things operate. And so in some cases, you have to shatter myths, and no one likes to have their own myths about how they think things operate and get shattered, because we have natural resistance to that. Um, but that's in some cases where, where we're at, we we'll think, as a collective or individually. And, um, that's why this work is um, where it's at, I think, currently, because we still have as a collective, some learning to do about how things function and, and why it's necessary to, to take on the fight that these communities have. Um, in the state of Arizona, there's a movement to um, criminalize nonviolent violent um, And I think that this could be said to fall under that, these community bills of rights. How would the community deal with being actually criminally targeted for? Yeah, I don't, I don't know specifically, I guess my immediate thought was well, that's what the system wants to do. I mean, it wants to push you back inside the box by coming up with some other way to make sure you don't sit outside the box. And that could be something that applies to how it would. But um, to me, it's just about any time you want to actually call into question how things function, um, usually the system finds a way to tell you you can't do that. So it shoves, wants to shove you back in the box. So in some ways, I think that, to me, that's my reaction to, to that particular law. But I don't know how it would apply to I, I just mean in terms of, um, it seems like any sort of community bill of rights could be deemed non-violent protest and so might yeah. fall under that. Good. that. Yeah, no. um, you know, we had someone, had someone the other day ask me, well, what, what keeps the, you know, the state or the National Guard or the, you know, from coming in and actually escorting the corporate interest in to do their practice since those laws are equally built from the state's perspective? I don't know, probably nothing. <laughs> it hasn't happened yet, but I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, and in some ways, great, because it begins to show how the system functions and who the system wants to validate and support and who it doesn't. So, and, and you don't want those things probably to happen, but if they do happen, you have to figure out how to actually use it to your advantage to show people, well, this is how the system functions, which again is not unprecedented in this country. I mean, during the labor strikes of the late 1800s, early 1900s against the railroads, you know, the militia, state militia, the National Guards came in, uh, the, corpus, the railroad companies even hired, um, you know, Pinkertons, you know, private, basically armies in essence to come in and put down these labor strikes that were very violent. So, and they always were about um, going, it was about protecting the corporate interests or property over that of individual labor rights. And in fact, during Black Reconstruction after the Civil War, the reason we pulled out of the South was to actually protect the railroad interests in the West. So we've seen this before in other realms, so I wouldn't be surprised if we start to see that on, on this level. So I guess like this isn't really explicitly stated on like Sellout's website or anything, but it seems like you're kind of trying to lead people into like having a large popular movement eventually. Would you say that? <laughs> um, I mean, in our view, if, if, if we want the, the, the higher structure to, to change, it's going to take that. 
Um, but it's still going to take individual action on the community level to actually get to that point. Um, and again, that only comes with communities deciding for themselves. Not just come with someone like myself or anyone else telling you to do something. Yeah. Um, you have to have your own will to do it, whatever it's wrapped around. Um, if you believe that this is how things are, function, are functioning and you want to, in essence, have a different sort of structure, um, our belief is you have to take, take it on for what it is. So in some ways, one of my fellow organizers said it's about picking a fight. If you're going to pick a fight, might as well pick a big one. And so that's, that's how he frames it a lot when he talks to community groups. You know, it's about picking a certain fight. An even bigger fight. One extra thing to add, which is more at the national level, but you see echoes of it at the local, is the National Security Act of 1947, which established the Department of Defense and the Central Intelligence Agency, and is the structure for the uh, public extra judicial aspects of the government, the so-called intelligence agencies, which are intimately intertwined with the corporations. It's nice to see all this anti-corporate agitation going on, but what's equally important are the three-letter agencies that run huge parts of the federal government. And you know, how many people know Obama's first job after college was with the Central Intelligence Agency? Their nickname is The Company. And there's a huge back and forth between the corporations and the intelligence world, and they are not really subject to judicial oversight. We also have things like the former uh, chief attorney for the CIA is now a federal judge in the D.C. Circuit Court. I think, really. <coughs> and we think he's going to rule on the merits of a case that we're bringing about some abuse. Or, this trickles down to the way the police departments are behaving in this town and pretty much every other town. And Arizona just passed, I think it was a law, I don't think it's been signed in yet. Um, I think it was through the legislature saying you can't say anything offensive on the internet. Well, who's going to define that? You know, everyone has a different standard of what that's going to be. Um, so there's this huge backlash going on everywhere. The bottom line is the way the empire has been treating communities in other countries is now coming from the roost because. The truth is, the bulk of people in this country have been fine with it. They're what? The bulk of people in this country have not objected to the way the empire has behaved overseas, even if we have. And now it's being used against us here in our country. But by now, the military is getting bigger and bigger, and the police, there's more police, too. <laughs> So one of the things we're finding in Dexter is that I, and we're, we're trying to we're trying to identify sort of three theaters to, to fight this each corporation with millions of dollars back in them. And we're we're raising money by big sales and hired an attorney out of Corp Analyst. Did the grand corporation have to have a big sale? Yeah, yeah. that's right. That's right. Air forces. Um, so we got a single guy against a against a bunch of corporate attorneys. It's pretty interesting. One of the things we found is that it's really difficult to maintain sort of a state of optimism and um, a state of uh, just just keep your energy level up enough to fight it. People get burned out in a hurry. First thing we went up against when we started making noise was a uh, slap suit, uh, a threatened slap suit. So we all got a letter from the corporation saying, hey, if you guys are going to try to stop our grant from ODOT, the taxpayer money, you know, you're all uh, putting yourself at risk because you know, we're consulting with our attorneys and blah, blah, blah. Threatened slap suit, but it scared a whole bunch of people away, by the way. Somehow, what I'm finding is is we have to sort of make the battle a little bit fun. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, people just burn out. I mean, you have to, you have to find some things to sort of laugh at, to sort, of, sort of keep your energy level up, just to keep people in the spirit of, of, of fighting this thing. Yeah. And, uh, and keep it interesting. Sure. Uh, if you can keep learning, that's one thing. So we're learning a lot about law, how it works. It's all depressing. It's all the stuff that you've covered. We're learning a lot about politics and how that works. Um, so learning itself is sustaining us a little bit. But there's some other stuff. You have to kind of keep it enjoyable. You have to kind of enjoy the strategy of it. You have to, and, and, and
and identifying the different theaters and saying, okay, there's this whole political realm that's got to to change. And this whole public relations thing that's got to change, or, or public, uh, public opinion thing has got to change before the politics change. So a, a lot of it is what you're doing here, but the question is, kind of a long-winded one, but how do you personally maintain a state of optimism given that you've yeah, so I'm, I mean, a good example of, of folks in Spokane, so Spokane's been trying um, to some degree for about seven years more, directly for about five years, put a bill of rights in place in the city of Spokane. Um, and they've had to do so by citizens' initiative uh, because their council has not been supportive. In fact, they've been outwardly oppositional to the citizens' group. Um, and all along the process, it's always been you can't, you can't, you can't, from all those perspectives to everything else you can think of. And so they have to go through all of that. They went through an initiative process. Uh, they went through a campaign in 2009 uh, and got destroyed at the polls. Uh, they lost uh, three to one, 75 to 25. Um, and so that was probably, for most cases, uh, a validation or permission to go home <laughs> and be done with it. But um, the folks started out who've been at the core understood this was a long-term process. So they already put the horizons uh, much further out for when uh, this may pass, as well as the understanding that when it passes, the work's not over yet. So I think their 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 time frame is different um, versus looking to kind of the short term sort of political win. They they do this this deeper cultural shift kind of stuff that has to happen. Um, and they actually sort of looked at that vote in 2009, and even though percentagely it was very clear what happened, they all looked at it and said, well, 13,000 people voted for this thing. Mm -hmm. Meaning there was 13,000 people, to whatever degree they were at, and they're thinking about it, understood that we're about restructuring how government works and who government is about. And so they used that as inspiration to go back and do it again. Um, and they barely lost this last November with a different version of the Bill of Rights. Um, but they managed, this time there were 29,000 people that voted for it. I mean, it was literally a thousand vote difference, so 500 votes would have swung it, um, over two years. Um, this idea of rights has really sort of started to resonate with people in Spokane. This idea that why shouldn't I decide what my neighborhood looks like if there's large development coming in? Why is it the developer that decides and not us as residents? Or why shouldn't we have better ways to protect the river and the aquifer that we rely on for its own sake? Or why we as workers shouldn't have certain rights be put in place? Why should all that be challenged by corporate rights? So this idea of rights has really stayed around. And I think for those folks, that's been the motivating factors to see the growth of that. And understanding that the structure, when they lost that first time, the structure didn't change. The structure was still the way it is, and they were all about the structural change stuff. So in some ways, when you understand how the structure works, and you're about changing the structure, in some ways it gets easier to do this work, because one, you know what it is that you're pointing towards. And eventually, when you start to do this enough, when things come down, like the state legislator being in a position or putting a law that puts the Attorney General on to sue you or that there's these preemptive laws coming in around fracking and all this stuff, you get less and less surprised at what they're going to do in essence to try to, to knock you down. So the question is, it becomes like a chess match. We're trying to think about and think ahead. Well, how do we build the momentum? How do you build the people to understand this to really crack it in the way that we, know, uh, the way that we need to crack it? And so um, in some ways it becomes less uh, energy draining and actually more invigorating even as the shitty they get, um, it's about turning and using that energy on your behalf uh, in a way to build to build the effort. And I think for Spokane, that's it's been the case with the core people. In fact, those who started it six or seven years ago, pretty much everyone that started it is still there. Um, you now, you know, they say it's you know they get tired about having to go off petition and do all the you know, the bake sale kind of stuff because that's what you're left with. Um, but overall, they're still very energized, and it's very interesting to see how much more outspoken, not only they become, but others have become. So for instance, on Monday night, we talked about this to the group last night, in Spokane, uh, a new city council came in, uh, very much more, more towards the right, very conservative, and at the request of the Home Builders Association, which was one of the big uh, opponents to the Bill of Rights, um, both times made a request to the city council to look at overhauling the initiative process again. So that's it's making it more difficult. Wow. And so the two councilmen that are sponsoring this uh, proposed change had an open house this past Monday. And so we sent word out that this open house was going on, and their, their, their interest was to get the input from the people. Yeah, so people showed up, and it wasn't just our people, but people from the Move to Men world, the Occupy, uh, came. And in fact, they spoke 
more so than our people did against this idea of the change happening. So um, in some ways, uh, that's come, I think, because of other things that may have happened nationally, but also comes because I think people have been observing what the local group has been doing, and this idea of pushing for rights and trying to expose how the system operates and how a lot of times government actually protects the corporate interest and not the people's interests. And so that's become more recognizable the more that the, the local group in that community has, has pushed it. And of course, the interesting thing is, um, of the 80 people there, about 40 people actually spoke. Not one person uh, spoke for the changes. They all spoke against it. Uh, and I just got an email today from the council president who spoke to one of the sponsors of the initiative. But he says he's got no interest in actually polling the proposal. He's going to move forward with it. So even though it was about hearing from the people who all said, don't do this, it's not stopping him from doing it. Right. And of course they have votes, because they have the, the, they have a, we have seven people on our council, four of them are of that same mindset, so, I mean, again, it's, we're not surprised, um, and it's probably going to get changed. And so those are the kind of things that come when you start to do this work, so it's like a chess match. So then our chess match is, okay, well, change it, but well, we're going to file now under the, under the old rules, because <laughs> we can. And so at least this next time, it's not going to be that bad to file our initiative, but of course the next time it may be because there may be new rules in place, well then you have to adjust to that. And that's part of, again, maybe part of the frustration of how things have to operate. But at the same time, once you know how it operates, it's again less surprising. And so people there stay motivated. And for me personally, you know, that's what keeps me motivated too, is when I see communities pick up the fight and want to run with it. Um, whether it's a new community or one that's been at it for a while, that's what we can. Or hearing that, that uh, uh, community in New Mexico on Monday passed the Bill of Rights, you know, which is great. It's the first community in, in the Southwest to, to do such a thing. That's the, they're small victories in some ways, but they're enough to actually keep, you know, keep me interested. Yeah, one thing that's in our, in our advantage is that we're not in France, where people are used to a highly centralized government, that is to say Paris, you know, determines what goes on here, right? <coughs> If you tell more more people what I heard today, you have no right to local self-government. Most people will say, what are you talking about? Because they're so accustomed to the idea that we have the right to elect a local self-government. And when they think that's kind of false, they might get a little bit annoyed or even really upset. So that's one thing going in our favor. Um, you mentioned that in this current structure, nature is property, mm -hmm. and I'm just curious where in the timeline of all of this do we begin to talk about securing rights for nature as opposed to viewing it as something to just simply use? Sure. Because last night you were mentioning focusing more on a single issue <coughs> within um, the, like for right now, the coal trains. Focusing down on one particular point that the community is concerned of, do we also start talking about making nature a right-bearing entity, or is that something that you see as like a side effect of, of hundreds of communities working in conjunction? So um, I can answer that in a couple of different ways. You have about two dozen communities in this country that already recognize nature as having rights. So, and the latest being. Las Vegas, New Mexico. So they have a, a rights of nature provision within their ordinance that recognizes nature as rights bearing and not as property. Um, on an international scale, the country of Ecuador is the only the country that in their own federal constitution has a rights of nature law, or their, their law is based on nature's rights, not on nature as being property. Um, they've actually had two cases that have come in front of the courts. Um, of which uh, nature, in essence, has won those court cases. So interestingly enough, when those uh, uh, cases have been filed, it's the, the ecosystem itself that is, um, I said, the defendant, the uh, plaintiff, so, which is not what you would see <laughs> in, in law today. Um, but they were, it was ruled on behalf of, of nature's rights. In one of the cases, it was about a road construction project that. Um, that severely affected the flow of the river, constricted it, caused all kinds of uh, other problems down the river, and uh, the people used the rights of nature law, in essence, to, to, to speak on behalf of, of that ecosystem. 
And part of that law then is about restoring that ecosystem, <coughs> which is also very different from how our environmental law works today. So even when you, when people do negotiate some restoration, it's it's usually never to the level of what it would really take to fully restore something that's been damaged. Um, so that's part of where where things are at. And again, that's all very new. That's a 180 degree, you know, twist to what uh, we normally do around the environment, uh, not only here but anywhere else. Um, but the, for instance, Bellingham and their no coal ordinance, they have a rights of nature provision in their ordinance. So it's not as if they're not ignoring it. Um, theirs happens to be around coal, but as I was explaining last night, it doesn't mean that one couldn't try to enforce the rights of nature against some other harm um, from something else. Uh, it just gets a little more clear when you specify what, what might be potentially harming the environment, in this case, saying that the coal trains uh, they have potential impact on the environment and that we're going to advocate on, on, on behalf of nature. So that stuff's all very new because it's very new kind of thinking about how we actually live with nature and potentially protect nature. Um, that's probably the most, in some ways, the most radical aspect of, of this kind of work because you're getting you're trying to do a paradigm shift about how we've actually viewed um, the environment, not only from a legal perspective, but I think even culturally, if you start talking with people about it, they probably think you're crazy. Um, so it's it's started, but I think we have a long way to get again culturally for our, our view shift. Which in some ways this work is less about the law and it's more about culture. I mean, I think you were talking about um, a couple of people talked about the idea that yeah, people's mindsets could be different. So our bigger barrier is really the cultural the cultural shift that needs to be undertaken. Um, but part of it is actually in essence to prove to folks or to show to folks how things work and hopefully get them to start thinking differently. I think nature is one aspect of of where we have to start thinking differently and how we protect it, how we recognize it. You know, the Supreme Court <coughs> Justice William A. Douglas, who about 40 something years ago, wrote, Do trees have standing? Mm -hmm. um, are you familiar with that? Yeah, and that was an issue of, about standing. But it was, it was definitely where um, some of the stuff derives from, mm -hmm. the, 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 the evolving that sort of mindset. And of course, the idea of rights of nature is not something new. Of course, most indigenous folks have had some sort of rights of nature practice already. Um, but we, as sort of Western thought, um, have decided to take a different view. We've taken a property view of nature, and uh, a more dominant, uh, dominating uh, view of how we interact with nature. Any more questions? Of course, she was the only justice who supported it. That's true. Um, I was wondering, I uh, saw folks here working on coal, if you talk more about um, using ordinances for coal, and I've asked you this before, but um, just for other people, about like what might be different um, or similar for us passing this ordinance for the coal trains, as opposed to the way it's worked for things like fracking. Yeah, I mean, so, again, I used uh, factory farms and fracking examples more often than anything else, but you're, you're in essence in a very similar boat around um, the coal stuff because you don't have the power as a local level to say no to the coal trains on a variety of uh, uh, stances, whether it's state or federal. Um, so if you put an ordinance together that resembles, for instance, what Bellingham is doing, you're joining the ranks of other communities to necessarily step outside the box and challenge the notion that you don't have those rights. It's about asserting those rights. Um, and so again, that framework, um, if people want to see what that would potentially look like for Eugene, um, if you go to coldfreebellingham.org, um, their ordinance is up there, and it'll give you some idea of what an ordinance uh, in regards to the coal trains can look like. Um, an interesting thing about the Bellingham folks, they spent a, a long time sort of getting there. They took a number of workshops, they took a number of democracy schools, they had a number of discussions to sort of talk about you know, what's going on in our community, understanding how this broader system uh, operates. And they kind of played around with uh, sort of two different possibilities, one being sort of um, the single issue type ordinance framework, or sometimes we call it the Pittsburgh ordinance, because Pittsburgh was the first municipality to pass that kind of a, a law in that sort of framework, or something like Spokane, which Spokane was all about looking at the city as a whole, looking at a lot of issues, whether it was low income housing, whether it was looking at local economy, whether it was looking at workers' rights. And they were taking a kind of a broader holistic 
the viewpoint versus looking at just stopping some type of a corporate threat. And so that group played around with, you know, what do we want to do for our community that makes sense. And it was about that time that the coal issue came up and they understood, okay, that's, that's what we need to wrap this around. They got understanding that it, it was bigger than just the coal, but they needed something to sort of get people interested and connected to it. Because I think it was you that was saying earlier, how do you talk about corporate rights for corporate rights sake? Because we've had people say, well, just run a corporate rights ordinance. It's like, well, you can do that, but you know, how do you actually get people interested and involved when it's not wrapped to something that's more tangible? So the coal trains end up being a tangible way to sort of do this kind of work. Um, and that may be the thing to do here in Eugene is around the understanding that trying to do something around the structure and decision making structure and the coal train could be the issue which people could gravitate towards. In some ways, if it does pass, then you have another, you have grounds in essence to stand on to look at other aspects like food sovereignty or whatever it might be to look at other major issues because now you have people understanding sort of that rights based the rights based frame. Maybe some people understanding how the deeper structure works. Uh, and it kind of becomes again another one of those blueprints of what's possible that we need to happen at the state and the federal level eventually. So once one of these ordinances passes in a community, does it mean that all corporations in that community lose their um, rights no. that way, or just those related? Corporations? Yeah. So if you were in a campaign mode or signature gathering mode, that question will probably come up. It's basically saying only when corporations come into conflict with limited <coughs> activity. Uh, only. Or in Spokane's case, if it was about neighborhoods having decision-making power over large-scale development, it's saying that when corporations' <laughs> rights run into the neighborhoods' rights, that the corporations can't use those in that particular instance. So it's not a blanket stripping of corporate rights. It's actually putting in regards to the decision-making power about a specific issue, um, which um, is how it would work. So. Do you find it easier in a community to pass something like this where the powers that be do not have financial ties to the threat as opposed to, say, there's no, in Eugene, the local politicians have ties to the road construction and developers and timber barons, that's who put them in there. And there's no grassroots effort really of any scale to deal with those two issues in this community. Whereas if in the unlikely scenario that a coal train ever did come through Eugene, the peak the powers that be here, there are no coal mines in the Willamette Valley, and so they can get cheap grace and say, oh yeah, we're against that. But if you ask them to say stop spraying us with on the helicopter, well they do have ties to that. And that's different. <laughs> yeah, I think you have that, you definitely have that power structure operating, and, and so probably, yes, I mean, we've, we've seen that before. Um, and in a lot of cases, um, in the smaller towns, um, <coughs> everyone's proximity to the, to the thing is a lot closer, and so we've seen elected officials actually, you know, take the lead in a lot of cases. In other cases, it hasn't been the elected officials at all, in fact, they've been oppositional, so it's been about citizens group bringing up the issue. So. Each, each community varies. Um, we were talking earlier with some of the, the, the no coal folks about, you know, do you put this in front of the city council and say, you know, we should pass this. So, you know, do you test that to see where the council sits or not? So these are all things that you look at doing. It's a hell of a lot easier to get your council to vote it in than it is for you to go through a election process. <laughs> so, um, you know, in Spokane's case, you know, they've all been against it. In Pittsburgh's case, it was the, the city council that unanimously passed their Bill of Rights. Um, in fact, at the opposition of um, the municipal attorney saying, you can't do this, they said, well, thank you very much. The health, safety, welfare is more important than whatever you say the law says. Um, which interesting thing is in uh, New Mexico's case, <laughs> this, the town there, their own municipal attorney was trying to sue the city council people from right. actually considering passing the law. Mm -hmm. um, and, which is very interesting because the municipal attorney works for the municipal corporation, so in essence works for the city council members, so, and the attorney wanted to sue the council people for considering passing the law. Mm -hmm. And another thing you'll see happen is that, um, you know, insurance companies that insure municipal corporations for things like their legal activities, um, well, some, in some cases when they see these laws passed, they say we no longer can insure you, they'll drop the municipal corporation's insurance because they don't want to be liable for something of which 
uh, could be deemed illegal or unconstitutional. So it's another way in which you get jammed inside the box. When I said there's other things that happen, those are the things that, that scare communities and not wanting to do anything because of how the system comes crashing down on you, either with litigation or the removal of, of liability insurance, for instance. So do we know where our city council is with this issue at all? I don't think it's been tested yet, from my understanding. Um, but, but maybe it's a good place to start. In some ways, it's also good to see, you know, are you going to get support or you're not going to get support, you know, whether they do anything with it or not. Um, sometimes uh, you, the best you can hope for is that your council will at least uh, validate the uh, direct legislation process and at least support that. Maybe not say anything against against or for the substance, but maybe say, well, the people need to decide. Sometimes that's not a bad thing because at least they stay neutral. Um, so you never really know where elected officials are going to stand. We need to also remember is that when you get voted into office, whether it's the municipal level, county, or state, you uphold your allegiance to the Constitution of wherever you're at, Oregon or the federal government. And so you're in essence, you're bound by the system about how it operates because you've made pledge your allegiance to it. So in some ways, again, we shouldn't be surprised that elected officials don't do more of this kind of stuff because they're sort of, they're kind of locked into doing that. In fact, municipal attorneys, of course, are all locked into upholding the constitutions of where they practice law. So one of my colleagues gave a talk to some municipal attorneys in Seattle about this work, you know, framing all the things that we framed here tonight. And one of the municipal attorneys um, at the end of the speech got up and said, kind of like, had kind of an aha moment and says, wow, maybe we're part of the problem. Because <laughs> municipal attorneys become the gatekeepers because when City council members want to take a look at this. Well, who do they go to first? They go to the municipal attorney to see if this is, you know, can we do this or not do this. And when the municipal attorneys look at what's being proposed, they put up against the system. Of course, they tell them they can't do this for all these different reasons. And so they end up being the stopgap to actually push a lot of this stuff forward because people are scared of of the legal consequences, you know, or what we call it's, it's the law syndrome. You know, everyone says, well, it's the law. And suddenly that's, that, in most cases, shut things down. So it's another thing um, that forces you to stay inside the box, because all you hear is, it's the law. And the Eugene City Attorney came from Perrin Long, which is the law firm that represents all the local developers. Um. Ta-da. <laughs> Sorry. Great. You have about enforcement. Um, I'm mostly wondering, I guess I, I talked to somebody who organizes a non fracking and he said that he thought that one of the reasons why ordinances had been challenged more was because corporations so far, maybe not with the coal issue, but they've been able to avoid having to challenge them by just like finding other places to do the bad thing. Sure. I mean, in some cases that's true. They'll just say, well, why bother here? Especially when you look at like hydraulic factoring that can be done horizontally. You can stick your, your well hole there, but then you can go that way with it. <laughs> it's to say, okay, you're not going to do it. We'll just go over here. We can set the well, and we're still going to drill underneath where you're at. Um, so that's definitely probably part of the reasons. Um, but in Pennsylvania, they, in some ways, they didn't bother because now they passed a new state law, Act 13, which is actually about nullifying all those local laws. Um, so in some cases, they don't bother anymore with trying to attack or sue a, a local local governments anymore, they go straight to the state legislator and actually put them either in a position or, or pass another preemptive law that says you can't do that explicitly. So, so that's part there, of the reason they don't get challenged. Has there been any, you know, any like utter disregarding of the ordinances, like corporations just continuing to do things despite being an ordinance? No, I think in all cases where they've been, when, they, when these laws have been put in place, they've actually kept out whatever it is that the community want to keep out. So in, in the short term, they're doing what the community hoped they would do. Um, another reason why sometimes these don't get challenged is the corporations don't want to, in essence, open up the hornet's nest and how they know how the system works. They don't really want other people, in essence, to understand how the system works. And so if they sue, they have to actually have all these arguments about how all these different legal pieces work that empowers them to have more rights in the community. And so they don't really want to have that argument. In some ways, they don't want to touch it, um, which is why we build the ordinances the way that they're built, is because they're built that way. So when they do touch it, it's about having to have these discussions on these key things about what keeps us from not having decision-making power at the local level. So there's a myriad of reasons about why some of the tracking laws haven't been touched. Um, that's definitely one of them. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting to me that 
they just seem to shut it down. Well, you can't do it because the law says you can't, and then that's it. Yeah, you'll find that um, definitely. More reinforcement, more <laughs> self assurance about my rights. We're all about the <laughs> <laughs> How do you go about when they try to finalize you? You can say, you know, well, we can't do that law. That's the end of the conversation. How do you press some more and say, well, you know, that's not the end of it? Yeah, and I think that's that's part of what this is demonstrating is people's unwillingness to live under what they say is the law. Mm -hmm. um, you know, which in some ways, go in a different time and space and other things are going on. I mean, it's exactly what the revolutionaries did in saying that we no longer want to live under, under, the, under the British king. It wasn't just about separating from England, but it was about separating from the English form of law. And that's what the Declaration of Independence was about. It was actually trying to establish something new. Um, and so, again, when you don't have the justice or the remedy under what the structure is, um, can you then justify living under that system? And if not, then you have to be able to think about how you can go about changing it or living in a different realm. And so part of the hope of this is to, to show what may be possible uh, on that bigger scale by using the local as the place to demonstrate that way. And some of the thinking is that if you don't have, in essence, to some degree, more decentralized decision making, you're going to continue to have the structure that we have today. And again, that's a lot of what the revolutionaries were pushing for was this idea of more decentralized decision making power or this ability to protect and enhance rights, yeah. uh, which we had a very short lived experiment of that before the US Constitution came in and actually went the complete opposite direction. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it really comes down to what's the will and are and people mobilizing enough? And, are, are people um, dissatisfied enough not to, 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 in essence, live with under what the system says is allowable? Um, in the state of Idaho, just a few weeks ago, they passed the similar laws as, as Pennsylvania did about restricting local power. And, um, you know, the question then to those folks is, well, if you're really against that practice from happening, um, what are you going to do about it now? You know, no one's really stepped forward for that. Because in essence, uh, uh, not doing anything in some ways is you're justifying that practice to take place. Um, and so if it's just if it's if it's fracking today, what is it tomorrow? Which for them, interestingly enough, it's not only fracking that may happen in southern Idaho, but they also approved the construction of a nuclear <laughs> nuclear power plant <laughs> as well down there. So they decided, I guess, to be their own resource colony. But um, yeah, and it really comes down to what what are you going to do about it? And are you going to speak up? And are you going to push back? And not only push back, but actually sort of envision what could really be. And again, when I say blueprinting, this is, about <coughs> this is how it could actually look, not only for us, but on a larger scale. So it's, it's, I guess it depends on how dissatisfied people get. Um, and unfortunately, it usually means something coming in to actually wake a community up before they actually do anything. So it's usually that crisis that has to come um, before there's a mobilization. And maybe that's a human thing, I don't know. Um, but. Yeah, there's a lot yet to be seen. Um, and in some ways, it's pretty extraordinary that 140, 150 communities have actually done this so far, knowing that this is the structure we've lived under and knowing what they've been hammered with when they try to do something different. It's actually pretty extraordinary that we have that many communities that have done, that have done so far. So in Pennsylvania, they, um, they, the, the state has passed this law that nullifies all the community's laws. Is that what's that now? Um, on the factory farm issue and pretty much on the fracking issue. We've also done it for other industries too, like GMOs. So the, so the communities are just choosing to, to uh, not listen to this law that's against them now? Yeah, we still have communities considering passing a bill of rights that ban fracking, regardless of what the state law says. So they're being defined to the state law, saying we don't care what you say. We don't want it, so we're going to pass law that says so. So, in essence, they're being, dis they're being disobedient to what the state law says. So it has to stop them. Um, in fact, in some cases, it's probably motivated them. Because uh, then it's another element to show you that you don't have the ability to decide what happens with your own community. Um, in this little break here, since people are kind of starting to leave, um, I, I, I know it's kind of depressing, I think, but I think it's also, I think going through the 
regulation cycle over and over again would also be more depressing. And I think looking at the situation with coal trains now, it's really depressing because there's, there's like besides this, there's virtually no way to actually stop them. Um, besides like writing petitions and trying to pressure the coal company that we don't even know which coal company it is. Like it's just there's no way to do it. And this is the only, to me this is like the only like ray of hope that yes, it's it's really messed up. And yes, it's like going to be really difficult and um, will be challenged and could be overturned in court, but like builds a broader movement and uh, I think has a lot of promise. So um, I don't know if you still have more to talk about, but before you leave, I'm going to have the sign-up sheets for the different working groups. So if you want to get involved um, in helping to write this, helping to tell people about it, helping to build, get, bring more people in to talk about it, um, please sign up before you go um, so, we can, so you can, we can get to work on um, fighting all of the box things. So, yeah. uh, <laughs> thanks for coming. I mean, as it stands today, there's there's a will of a core group that are willing to take this on. So, in essence, about drafting something, more than likely having to go through initiative process and then they have to go through a campaign. So you've got a core group that's willing to do it, so you can still like what is your alternative to live? Yeah, I think it gets to sell, it gets to still down to that point. So um, yeah, I think somebody's the clarity is there. Um, and actually somebody does make it easier. Thank you everybody. Yeah.